The crash of September 2008 brought the largest bankruptcies in world history, pushed over 30 million people into unemployment, and brought many countries to the edge of insolvency. Wall Street turned back the clock to 1929. After the Wall Street crash of 29, which led to the Great Depression, the U.S. Congress launched an official investigation. Interest in the senatorial bank investigation as J.P. Morgan arrives to testify. J.P. Morgan was among the business titans to be called to account by the Pecora Commission. Flash photography was introduced to heighten the spectacle. In 2010, the same model is followed for a new investigation of a new financial collapse. Uh, panel, ladies, photographers, move aside. Former California Treasurer Phil Angelides is chairman of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. I'm honored to welcome you as we start this series of public hearings into the causes of the financial and economic crisis. He has taken sworn testimony from a parade of government and bank officials, trying to get to the bottom of what really caused the 2008 meltdown. I, 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 the consequences of this financial crisis have been grim also. Uh, 27 million Americans who are either out of work, um, can't find full-time work or stop looking for work, uh, millions who have lost their homes and millions more who are in the foreclosure process, trillions of dollars of wealth loss. I think one of our jobs is to try to rationally explain to people what the heck happened. People want to know. How did it all go so wrong? The key trigger of the 2008 financial meltdown was easy lending in the U.S. housing market. In an era of very low interest rates and reduced bank regulation, there was an astonishing building boom across the United States. In California, banks decided that virtually anyone could qualify for a home loan. Jim Kling has been a real estate agent in San Diego for over 20 years. Really, in 2004 and 2005, if you could fog a mirror, you could get a loan. That's how bad it was. They didn't really know or care about the qualifications of the buyers. And, a payment on that. and whether those people could make those payments or not apparently wasn't much of a concern. Bills getting to be more than you can manage? Crossroads Mortgage has a whole range of solutions geared to people just like you. So if you're thinking of buying a home or refinancing? Even if your credit is less than perfect, AmeriQuest can help. Call one 866 <laughs> Banks began making what were called subprime loans to people who could ill afford to pay back the money, especially if house prices ever went down. The one man who could have stopped that practice was then U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan. For 20 years, the world's most powerful banker. Greenspan was revered in Washington his power feared even by presidents. The Federal Reserve was the one agency that had the full authority to regulate subprime lending. And despite all the evidence, despite all the yellow and red lights going off, they chose not to. Staff reports, I mean, would you, let me just ask you, would you put this under the category of oops? Should have done it? I mean, my experience has been, uh, in the business I was in, I was right 70% of the time. But I was wrong 30% of the time, and there are an awful lot of mistakes in 21 years. And I would point out that the captain of the Titanic was 99% right and 1% wrong. It's the size of the mistake that matters. We now know that banks and mortgage companies were indulging in all sorts of fraudulent practices to pump up their mortgage business. Many of the loans were extremely complex and the terms hidden from borrowers there were low teaser rates that would automatically reset to much higher payments after a few months. It was no accident that the most complex mortgages were sold to the least sophisticated buyers, 
especially in poor and minority neighborhoods like this one in South Central Los Angeles. So as you go about your daily work and your daily business, Congresswoman Maxine Waters has represented the district for 19 years in the U.S. House of Representatives. Information. You know, I've seen mortgages that were given to 70-year-old people who were on a fixed income, whose income was never going to increase, but that market was going to reset within a few years. Where was that money going to come from? I've seen uh, mortgages that I think are criminal. Angela Mozilla was the undisputed king of the U.S. subprime market. He is called the golden boy because of his permanent tan and because at the height of the subprime real estate boom, he was making about a hundred million dollars a year. Everybody wanted to own a piece of real estate to get into the game. He became the darling of business magazines with a slew of fawning profiles of his rags to riches story. He always claimed that he was a friend to the poor and that his lending practices were helping scores of Americans attain the dream of home ownership. It's one thing for him to say that he was a friend to the poor, but in the final analysis, when you see that these poor people are now in foreclosure, now cannot get loan modifications, now ending up on the streets, then certainly that defies uh, how he could have been, you know, a friend to poor people. Mozilla's company, Countrywide Financial, grew to become the biggest mortgage lender in the United States. Call Countrywide. We never stop thinking about what you need. And that makes home buying easy. Really. Countrywide was sold to Bank of America and almost immediately plunged in value. Angela Mozilla was placed under investigation by the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC uncovered very damaging private emails in which Mozilla expressed his true feelings about the dangerous subprime mortgages he was peddling. He wrote, In all my years in the business, I have never seen a more toxic product. At the same time, Mozilla was publicly reassuring all his investors and clients. Countrywide views the product as a sound investment for our bank and a sound financial management tool for consumers. It does appear that there was a private view of the markets and there was one that was espoused to borrowers, uh, rating agencies, the investing public. The SEC has now charged Mozilla with insider trading and securities fraud. Lenders like Angela Mozilla really didn't care if people ever paid their mortgages because those loans did not stay on the mortgage company's books. Mortgages were bundled together with other loans from across the country and moved to Wall Street. There they were packaged up into complex new financial products. Bankers went wild for these financial securities that were really just stacks of IOUs. There was almost no government regulation of this market. It became a massive system of buying and selling these IOUs with fees being charged on each transaction. It was just all a way to make fees and to package up these streams of supposed cash flows and sell them off to investors. I mean, for a while there, anybody who touched a mortgage made money. It was like the most perfect product. I once had this view that when people started talking about toxic assets, that somehow they were like a good piece of fruit that had turned bad. Well, it turns out they were a rotten piece of fruit from day one. And all along the way, whether it was the broker, the lender, the securitizer, the market maker, everyone seems to have taken the view that they had no responsibility for the product that they were moving along in the system. That became, unfortunately, uh, this cancerous material that was injected into financial institutions all over the world. One of the first places these toxic products landed was the financial district of London, England, nicknamed the city. There was a golden age here in the years before the meltdown. Garrett Anderson arrived in the city as a young trader in 1996. He had been a hippie selling trinkets on the beaches of India until his older brother found him a job in a London brokerage. I literally didn't know what the city was. I mean, I, I kind of was aware that there was a stock market and I, and I said, well, why? I mean, you have to wear a suit and, and things like that. And he said, I'll tell you why. It's quite simple. You'll have about three, four hundred thousand pounds 
within about four or five years, and then you can go off and live the life you want, you want to live. Since the selling of trinkets wasn't going down too well, I thought, why not? <laughs> I had no idea about finance whatsoever. I didn't know what a P-E ratio was. I didn't know what a yield was. When you're in the city, all you have to do continually is present a view and present it strongly and pretend you believe in it. It was all about schmoozing clients, taking them to strip joints, taking them to bars, getting that company uh, credit card out and really giving it a bash. The wild atmosphere in Britain was brought about because Chancellor of the Exchequer Gordon Brown was easing financial regulation there. He called his new approach the light touch. We will advance if there is light touch regulation, a competitive tax environment and flexible. Well, Gordon Brown light touch was an effort really to make the city of London the world's greatest financial center. Um, and it meant giving the financiers, giving the bankers a very free hand in the marketplace. Paul Martin was Canada's finance minister in those years. He says deregulation came about because of a competition between New York and London to become the financial capital of the world. The race to become number one was very, very important. But how do you attract the financial industry? Well, the most logical way is what they call regulatory arbitrage, which simply says, let's gut the regulatory system, and therefore people will, more people will come. But the prevailing culture was one that um, you know, the markets always go up. It was an easy way to make money, drinking champagne, fat cat analysts. Um, it was a joyous time. Everywhere you looked, there was great big new offices being put up, statues being put in the forecourts, people building great monuments to themselves in, in terms of the buildings they occupied and the way that they behaved. By 2004, Garrett Anderson was making a salary of $300,000 a year, plus an annual bonus of $700,000. He was invited onto business television shows as an analyst. We had profit before tax growth of 9.5%. The whole game is increasing your bonus. You don't go into the city to do the world some good. You go there to make money as quickly as possible. And if that means lying, cheating and stealing, that's what you do. Regulators and politicians are just deemed to be idiots. It's all about we will thrive with light touch regulation. And that, of course, is exactly what Gordon Brown was encouraging as Chancellor Exchequer. And interestingly, he calls my precise period in the city the age of irresponsibility. But it was partly to do with the fact he just said, anything goes. And you know, to me, it's just obvious. The way people were behaving was a rational way of behaving in the context of the bonus system and the lack of regulation. Before long, the Anglo-American risky financial model was spreading around the world, from Iceland to Dubai. If one country could be the microcosm of everything that went wrong in the years before the meltdown, Iceland is it. It is a place of staggering natural beauty. From its geysers, to its waterfalls, to its famous Blue Lagoon, it is a magnet for tourists. One thing Iceland was never known for was banking and high finance, at least until a few years ago. Iceland was transformed through the ideas of one man, longtime Prime Minister David Odson. He decided to shake Iceland out of its social democratic past and remake the country according to his free market principles. He surrounded himself with like-minded admirers. David Oddsson is somebody who fulfills the two criteria that uh, uh, Machiavelli uh, puts uh, up about uh, political leaders. He is cunning as a fox and he is courageous as a lion. David Oddsson wanted to privatize almost everything touched by government. Iceland's number one resource industry has always been fishing. Oddsson parceled up the country's fishing grounds and passed them off to big ship owners. On Egil Helgeson's popular political TV show, the reaction was disbelief. 
Diana, welcome in Silver Ale. For many people, this would sound as it's almost, almost surreal. You take the, the fishing ground, the fish that swims in the sea, and you give it to a bunch of people who own ships for, uh, for good. This is, this is the main resource of our country. This was the beginning of, uh, of, of what came later. In 2003, Odson made his most controversial privatization. Some of the biggest banks in the country were auctioned off in suspicious circumstances. Coincidentally, they ended up in the hands of some of David Odson's closest friends. Mr. Odson's friends were father and son who came from Russia with some money they had made from uh, shady dealings in the brewery business in, in St. Petersburg. And suddenly they were, found themselves to be the owners of the oldest bank in Iceland. These guys didn't know the first thing about banking. Uh, in retrospect, they're either greedy criminals or complete fools. The newly privatized Icelandic banks embarked on an orgy of dangerous financial practices. Bankers sold securities back and forth to each other at vast markups that falsely inflated their value. All Icelanders were encouraged to buy a house, or even two. The central bank lowered interest rates, flooding the country with easy credit. As in the United States, this triggered an unprecedented real estate boom. Icelanders living and working abroad came home to take advantage of the wild market. I lived in the UK till 2003, 2004. Then I came home. I bought a flat for 9 million kroner here downtown, almost close to where we are now. One and a half years later, I sell it for almost 15 million kroner. I'm like, hey, what's, what's going on? I've done nothing to this flat. And here we are, six million kroner in my pocket, just for keeping it for one and a half years. And of course, when you're, when you're benefiting from it, you're sort of, okay, well, this is great. There's a saying now, if something is extravagant, oh, this is so 2007, you can't be serious. 2007 is having Elton John in your 50th birthday party as one of the business tycoons did. People just went too far. People took one loan too many. People bought one car too many. Iceland was not alone in its reckless financial planning during the boom years. The world champion of the global real estate bubble was surely Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. Money was no object, as every local sheikh and every booming company competed to see who could erect the most ostentatious building. No idea was considered too outlandish. When waterfront property rose dramatically in value, Dubai decided to make more. Ships vacuumed sand off the ocean floor to make the famous Palm Islands. On them were built an endless line of luxury condominiums and hotels that were snapped up by wealthy investors from across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Canadian Robert Lee went to work for Dubai's leading real estate company 10 years ago. Dubai in its heydays, we used to call the sales center the fish market. Um, it's, you know, people could come and it would say, give me an apartment, any apartment, I don't care what, two bedrooms, three bedrooms, just give me an apartment. Because in a way, people are buying options. Because most people were buying things with zero intention of actually living in it. So they were buying coupons to resell it to somebody else. We'd be selling a billion dollars worth of real estate in one day. All of this flowed from the vision of one man, Dubai ruler Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. When he saw the first plans for what would become the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa, he had only one comment to the developer, make it bigger. I was silly to uh, suggest a 90-story building, and the meeting was very short. He just left. But, you know, I've been with him a long time, so I, I went again to the design studios, and then we put something really marvelous, and uh, his question was, how much higher than anybody else? I said, it's about 40% plus. He said, great. He called me the next day, and he said, he said, where are the cranes? Was there no limit to how high Dubai could fly before it got too close to the sun? There was always a nagging sensation that is Dubai 
going to be like the other cities around the world that has seen the fall. But at the same time, you live here for a few years, you basically buy the story. You drink the Kool-Aid. And you're saying, hey, we must be different. While Sheikh Mohammed apparently believed that the party could go on forever, some began to wonder when the global real estate bubble would burst and what would set it off. become the central actor in the meltdown took his position on the stage in 2006. Former Goldman Sachs CEO Hank Paulson was one of the toughest of the Wall Street Titans. Then he accepted the invitation of George W. Bush to become the U.S. Treasury Secretary. It was a controversial choice. Paulson was not universally loved on Wall Street. He was probably the nastiest guy of all of them. They used to call him the snake. And this is coming from the Wall Street executives themselves. No, you know, you really can't believe everything he tells you. The reason why they didn't like him is because they couldn't trust him. Hank Paulson's aggressive, combative style came as a bit of a shock in government circles. This is a guy who would go through a brick wall to achieve his objective. Le Leopard doesn't change his spots. I mean, uh, you know, why do scorpions sting? They sting because that's their nature. and. You know, Hank Paulson didn't change his nature when he went to Washington. Shortly after Hank Paulson arrived in Washington, the prices of California houses began to slide. Sales of existing homes are down a full 12% from just a year. As prices dropped, overextended homeowners threw more properties onto the market, triggering a downward spiral. Hank Paulson called me and started talking to me about subprime mortgages um, in the United States. There was a general consensus that there was too much credit and too much money sloshing around globally. We had had discussions about where this excess credit was likely to show itself, and it was uh, showing itself in subprime mortgages in the United States, and that was a, uh, um, a large problem. Although few seemed to realize it, the world was now infected with the toxic financial products that depended on the U.S. real estate market. It was inevitable that someone somewhere was going to blow the whistle and question what these financial products were actually worth. As it happened, the alarm sounded in Paris in August 2007. The giant French bank BNP Paribas discovered that many of its investment funds were filled with toxic U.S. securities. They stopped all withdrawals from those funds. It was a little bit like an old-fashioned movie where the bank president locks the door and tells people they can't get their money. It's kind of, it doesn't exactly make you feel good about the world. At the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Paris, the BNP Paribas decision triggered immediate crisis meetings convened by Finance Minister Christine Lagarde. Ça a commencé de manière très dure, je m'en souviens très bien parce que c'était interruption de vacances immédiates, retour à Paris euh, et, et discussion immédiate avec les banques sur ces conduits qu'elles étaient en train de, de fermer en raison d'un début de fissure dans l'édifice financier. If BNP Paribas couldn't value their securities, then one started asking how many other companies couldn't value their securities. How did anyone know what the value of asset managers were, or even banks, because of course banks were holding the same securities. And so suddenly faith in some of the foundations of 21st century finance began to crumble. In September 2007, as cracks were appearing in the foundations of the global economy, the titans of the Anglo-American financial system began to tremble. First up was Britain's Adam Applegarth, a true superstar in London's business class. Applegarth had it all. He joined an obscure bank called Northern Rock in 1983 and had a meteoric rise, becoming CEO of the bank in 2001. Oh, he, he was a, a brilliant fellow, full of himself, full of confidence, 
felt he could do no wrong, loved the idea that he was become a, a transatlantic jet setter. He'd go over to New York to arrange the next tranche of securitized debt. And felt he had a model um, which was much better than everybody else. He didn't get it. He didn't, re he didn't get that he'd developed an unstable model and that the wholesale markets went wrong. Um, his bank would fall off a cliff very, very fast, which is exactly what happened. Good evening. One of Britain's biggest mortgage lenders, Northern Rock, is applying to the Bank of England for emergency financial support. BBC News has learned that the bank... Within hours of the BBC bulletin, worried Northern Rock customers lined up to get their money out. Maybe it's safe, maybe it's not, but I'd rather know that it was safe. I'm just going to go put it in my bank and then... And I've taken all of my money out. Most people in the Western world had never seen a bank run before with their own eyes. And so it was something they found almost impossible to imagine. The British government was very slow to react to the panic. It was egg on our face as the British authorities, no doubt about that. And letting those queues not only form but continue for two days was very damaging to the reputation of British banking. Adam Applegarth was hauled before a British parliamentary investigation of the failure of his bank, but he was characteristically defiant. Mr Applegarth, do you actually accept you've done anything wrong? It was a, a good business model, but clearly couldn't um, deal with the unforeseen global freezing of the liquid market. You keep saying it was unforeseen, yet this committee had been discussing it for six months. The Northern Rock crisis in Britain could have been taken as a serious warning on Wall Street, but it was not. I think people saw this as a, that's happening over there, that's not happening here. I think that the sense of interconnectedness was not realized until the very last moment. Wall Street did not really start paying attention to the growing international crisis until one of its own megastars began wobbling in orbit, the flamboyant head of one of America's oldest and biggest banks. Through the spring of 2008, U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson was constantly reassuring his international colleagues that everything was fine with the U.S. economy and that only mild tinkering was required with the global financial system. In private, French Finance Minister Christine Lagarde advised her friend that he was being very foolish. I told him, Hank, we see the tsunami that comes on us and you are on the beach trying to hesitate on the color of the maillot de bain that we will wear. The first major U.S. casualty of the financial crisis came with the dramatic fall of one company and one man, the richest CEO on Wall Street. Jimmy Kane was a legend. He had come up through the ranks to become president and chief executive officer of America's fifth largest investment bank, Bear Stearns. He was famous for his back-slapping, hard-drinking, and high-living style. Jimmy is really uh, out of central casting. I mean, I've described him as a, as a, you know, an amiable rogue. I mean, he's uh, definitely can be quite charming, definitely can be quite ruthless, uh, has a twinkle in his eye, and I think that combination of ruthlessness and charm, that people get to the top with that combination. Jimmy Kane was a flashy risk taker in business and in his personal life. In 2007, he was worth over $1 billion, and he wanted everyone to know it. Every Thursday afternoon after the stock market closed, he would board a private helicopter a few blocks from his Manhattan office and fly off to his country house on the Jersey Shore for weekends of bridge and golf. He did have one troubling habit that would come back to haunt him. He did, used to brag about smoking pot. I'm in the elevator of Bear Stearns, and it was 2004, 2005, and uh, Jimmy Kane tried to hand me what looked like a joint. I'm, I'm not kidding. Kane's pot smoking became public at the worst possible time for his firm. In the fall of 2007, Bear Stearns' risky bets on mortgage-backed securities began to go wrong. The firm started to hemorrhage money. 
Then in November, the Wall Street Journal carried a front page story which portrayed Jimmy Kane as an absentee landlord who was always out of touch at either golf games or bridge tournaments while his firm was in crisis. To top it off, the journal publicly revealed his taste for marijuana. Joe Kernan, who's my colleague on CNBC, says, Hey, Charlie, what do you think about that hatchet job that, uh, that the jur journal just did on, uh, on Jimmy Kane? And I don't know why I did this, but I started imitating smoke in a joint. Of course, issue, but also apparently, yeah, that yeah, whole bit. A little, uh, little smoke and a little pot say? there. What is it? Two minutes later, my cell phone rings, and it's Jimmy Kane screaming at me. And he's like, what are you doing? You, I, I, I don't smoke pot. I said, stop it. Stop it. I said, I said, listen, who cares? I mean, you know, it's, it, you know, you're not breaking the, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a harmless crime. Why don't you just laugh it off? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He goes, yeah. He goes, laugh it off. You try to laugh it off. You're not running a company. You know, Jimmy had made a lot of enemies on Wall Street. It was a very competitive Darwinian place. Uh, if uh, they smelled, uh, you know, chum in the water, uh, the sharks are going to circle. In January 2008, Jimmy Kane was forced out of the CEO position and became an unpaid chairman of the board at Bear Stearns. But the firm continued a downward slide. It had more exposure to toxic financial products than any other Wall Street firm. Kane had left a ticking time bomb behind him, and it exploded in March 2008. Rumors swept the financial world that Bear Stearns had liquidity problems, trouble raising cash. When Hank Paulson heard the rumors, he told his Washington staff, this will be over within days. He knew that Bear's clients would immediately pull their cash out of the bank, causing it to collapse. We have some breaking business news tonight. The storied investment bank Bear Stearns is reportedly close to selling its... Paulson was right. On Sunday, March 16th, Bear Stearns was taken over by rival J.P. Morgan in a deal bankrolled by the U.S. government. Just one year earlier, Bear's share price had been a lofty $170. Get this, it's valued at about $2 a share in this deal. Two bucks a share just last year. People thought it was a typo. Bear stock had traded, what, in the, in the 30s or 40s? The, the pre closed in the previous Friday, and so... You know, the idea that it would be worth two bucks a share was uh, impossible to fathom. Okay, but can I ask you a question? Uh, Do you think that in the... In May 2010, when Jimmy Kane was summoned before the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission to account for the collapse of his bank, he seemed to suggest it had nothing to do with him. Kane presented Bear Stearns as a victim of market history. The market's loss of confidence, even though it was unjustified and irrational, became a self-fulfilling prophecy. When I hear a lot of the people come before us, I'm struck by the extent to which all the fingers point away from themselves. And I'm struck by the extent to which so many people on Wall Street somehow do not uh, draw a correlation between the actions and activities and the risks they were undertaking and the crisis that occurred. Most world investors took exactly the wrong message from the bailout of Bear Stearns, that some banks were now considered too big to fail. The key message that emerged after the Bear Stearns bailout was that no matter what happens, the American government, and in fact it was, it was presumed the European government, will not let a big bank go bust. For some on Wall Street, it was obvious that the next domino to fall would be America's fourth largest bank, the venerable Lehman Brothers, run by one of the most feared and ruthless men in the United States. Perhaps the most reviled figure to appear before the U.S. Congress in the aftermath of the meltdown was former Lehman Brothers CEO Richard Fold. The 2008 collapse of his bank certainly caused the most damage to the world economy, and it financially ruined millions of Americans who had invested with Lehman. I'm very much aware that one day we had a firm, the next day we did not. At the hearings, Fuld became the prime target for a public that was angry at bankers.
Dick Fold had spent his entire career at Lehman Brothers, starting at the bottom and clawing his way up the ladder. In later years, he assumed all the trappings of unfettered power. His word was law, his judgment never to be questioned. There was a huge cult of loyalty to Dick Fold as the chief executive of the firm. People on the one hand admired what Dick Fold had achieved, but secondly, this was not an organization where you, as a matter of casual incident, decided it was a good idea to disagree with Dick. The way he created Lehman Brothers, it was almost a cult of personality. The, the personality was his personality, which was, we, it's us against them, we're going to fight everybody, and we're going to win. Dick Fold was determined to intimidate anyone who might cross him. In this internal Lehman UK video, he was angry that some traders were driving down his stock price. But what I really want to do is I want to reach in, rip out their heart, and eat it before they die. I think in the tape, there's a, there's a sort of nervous laughter in the auditorium. I think that sort of reflects quite a lot about how people within Lehman saw Dick. On the one hand, it sounded at one level amusing, and then you sort of thought to yourself, I suspect if you're in that audience, the really scary thing is he sort of could probably do it. Lehman Brothers entered its death spiral on September 11, 2008. The stock was plummeting. Dick Fold was advised that it was time for a fire sale of his corporate assets, but he resisted. Telephone records show that U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson spoke frequently with Fold, but he felt his message was not getting through. He was definitely exasperated with Dick Fold. I think everybody was. He seemed to be unable to recognize the gravity of the situation his firm was in and unable to do the things that were needed. On Friday, September 12th, Hank Paulson decided that it was time for drastic action to save Lehman Brothers, but he did not want to authorize another government bailout. He flew to New York on his private jet and summoned all the Wall Street CEOs to an emergency meeting at the New York Federal Reserve Building. You know, the fire alarms are going off. The tornado siren is going. And so when the chief of police and the chief of the fire department says we need the, uh, the heads of all the major employers in our town to come together to come up with a plan, you come. At 6 p.m., Hank Paulson started that secret meeting with America's leading bank CEOs. Jamie Diamond of J.P. Morgan, Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs, John Thane of Merrill Lynch, and John Mack of Morgan Stanley. I began working on a plan. Paulson told them that they all knew why they were there. Without their help, Lehman would not open for business on Monday, and the consequences for everyone sitting around that table would be disastrous. Across town, Dick Fold was astounded that Hank Paulson had not invited him to the crisis meeting. Here his company is basically being carved up, and he's not allowed to be there. He's calling, and they're not returning his calls. Inside Lehman Brothers, there was an air of unreality. The firm had been in existence since 1850. They had survived the Great Depression of the 1930s. They had survived the 9-11 attack that destroyed their offices in the World Trade Center. Surely they could survive this. And tonight, one of the biggest investment firms is in serious trouble. Lehman Brothers with a four... The Lehman Brothers stock has been plummeting along with confidence in its ability to survive... These people have been through it before. They were going through it again. Do you know what? The rest of the world hates us, but that's okay, because we're going to emerge on top here. And I believe that was what was persisting at Lehman Brothers right until midnight uh, on the famous weekend. I don't think anyone really at the senior management believed it was going to happen. On Sunday, the bankers finally came up with a private sector plan to save Lehman Brothers. The company would be divided in two. The solid assets of Lehman would be purchased by Barclays, a British bank. The American bankers agreed to take over the questionable parts of the company. Just as everyone was about to celebrate, word arrived that the British government would not approve the deal. Hank Paulson placed an emergency call to British Chancellor Alistair Darling but couldn't budge him. I understand Hank Paulson's problem. He had to sort out Lehman's problem. And he was, he, we had, the conversations we had were very amicable, and we understood each other's position. But I was quite clear. Uh, I could not agree to something where the British taxpayer was taking on a liability uh, that people didn't fully understand. 
Paulson hung up feeling deflated and frustrated. He announced to everyone in the room, the British screwed us. Objectively, this deal was never going to happen. And the most striking thing about this whole story is how little effort the Americans gave to talking to the British authorities until literally the last minute. Paulson knew Lehman's failure would bring financial catastrophe. Millions of people around the world would lose their savings and pensions. At this moment of maximum tension, Hank Paulson had a panic attack. He slipped out of the room and called his wife. I just said, Wendy, Lehman Brothers is going to fail, and it's going to be very bad, and a lot of people are looking to me, and I don't have all the answers, and I'm afraid, would you, would you pray for me? This has been an historic Sunday on Wall Street, Dan, and it's not, not over yet. yet. At this hour, the Lehman Brothers Investment Bank appears headed toward bankruptcy. With $613 billion in debt, Lehman is by far the largest bankruptcy ever in this country, dwarfing... On the sidewalks of New York and in investment houses around the world, there was a rising sense of panic. The fundamental issue that we face here... One who felt it was Mohamed El Arian of PIMCO in California among the world's largest institutional investors with one trillion dollars under management. I remember calling my wife and telling her, go to the cash machine, take cash out, because I'm not sure whether the banks are going to open tomorrow. There was a feeling that the system was incredibly fragile, that the unthinkable was clearly thinkable. Lehman Brothers officially declared bankruptcy at 2 a.m. There was widespread fear that could trigger a chain reaction that would take down the world banking system. At the New York Federal Reserve, then President Tim Geithner told his staff to prepare for the crash landing of Lehman. He told them to put foam on the runway. The problem is they didn't put nearly enough foam on the runway and there were all sorts of unintended consequences. The ripples that they anticipated turned out to be a tsunami. The tsunami unleashed by the crash of Lehman Brothers would sweep around the globe, destroying millions of jobs and wiping out the economic future of entire countries. Protests rock world capitals. From Reykjavik to Beijing to London. Sometime during the night of September 17, 2008, the world financial system went into cardiac arrest. The failure of Lehman Brothers, the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history, had sent financial markets into a tailspin. The New York Stock Exchange had its biggest one-day drop since the 9-11 attack. Markets from London and Paris to Shanghai fell in lockstep. Russia suspended all trading. In an epidemic of fear, the world's major banks stopped lending money and accepting collateral from each other. The next morning, at precisely 10.15 a.m., President George W. Bush stepped out of the Oval Office to try and reassure the public. The American people are concerned about the situation in our financial markets. I've canceled my travel today to stay in Washington and consult with my economic advisors. Bush convened that emergency meeting in the White House Roosevelt Room. According to notes, U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson told the president that the United States was on the edge of a total financial meltdown. He said, if we don't act boldly, we could be in a depression deeper than the Great Depression. Paulson had also warned, this is the financial equivalent of war, and we're going to need wartime powers. There was a moment, I think, in this country where at least for several days, the de facto president of the United States actually was not President Bush, but it was an unelected gentleman from Wall Street named Hank Paulson. Over the last two years, Hank Paulson has been summoned before numerous congressional investigations of the meltdown. Everyone realizes that the ruthless former CEO of Goldman Sachs played the leading role, and everyone wants to know why he did what he did. He was supposed to be the main free enterpriser in the Bush administration, 
but he ended up overseeing the greatest government intervention in the economy since the Great Depression. All investigations go back to his key decision in September 2008, the decision to allow Lehman Brothers to fail. In the White House on that Monday, Hank Paulson seemed almost flippant about the catastrophic bankruptcy. Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you all had an enjoyable weekend. <laughs> yeah. He said that it was not the role of government to save private businesses. I never once considered that it was appropriate to put taxpayer money on the line with, 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 uh, in resolving Lehman Brothers. Not saving them is a little bit like saying, well, we're not going to put the fire out in your house because you caused the fire because you were smoking in bed. And the guy who leaves next door will say, well, that's great for me when my house goes too because you're trying to teach this guy a lesson. The Lehman failure had repercussions around the world. Millions of people would lose their life savings. Pension plans were decimated. French finance minister Christine Lagarde would play a key role in the crisis. Although she was a close friend of Hank Paulson, she publicly called his Lehman decision horrendous. You know, I told him practically the next morning of the decision. I was, at the time, bien seul and sometimes a bit critiqué. I persist to think that it was a bad decision. Soudain, l'ensemble des établissements bancaires ont compris que personne n'était à l'abri et que toute banque pouvait tomber. À ce moment-là, l'ensemble des banques ont considéré que toutes leurs contreparties étaient en risque, peut-être, et elles ont bloqué tous les circuits de financement. Donc le, le crédit a cessé de fonctionner à ce moment-là. The immediate impact came in London. Where the Lehman Brothers UK office had to instantly shut down operations. A lot of Lehman's trading was done through its subsidiary in London, and every Friday it would send all its cash back to New York. So on the Monday morning in London, there was no cash. The holding company had gone into Chapter 11, and there wasn't a penny to pay the staff. And that was about the worst way you could possibly close a bank. And so you had these pictures of staff um, just leaving with boxes full of files. The uncertainty on day one was huge and very damaging. Excuse me, sir, how, how are you feeling? <laughs> how do you think? <laughs> so all of these investors, not just in Europe and Asia, but in the United States and everywhere, all of a sudden have no access to this cash, no access to any of these assets, and have to start selling down their own assets at fire sale prices. And they're getting margin calls. And it's uh, producing this sort of vicious circle. A and that was something that I don't think anybody, both among the regulators and even the Wall Street CEOs, appreciated was going to be the reaction. In international financial markets, there was rising panic. It began to look as if many other banks could follow Lehman into the abyss. There was great uncertainty, too, about where this was going to end. It was really gut-wrenching uncertainty, and that is hard to uh, accept. I mean, you deal with it, but you kind of go, where is the bottom here? Many governments blamed the United States. The, the U.S. authorities have not got a grip on this. They're, lose, they're losing control, and I think you saw that in the trade credit. Suddenly, it was impossible to get trade credit, and literally from that week, you see this dramatic downturn in world trade. And, of course, we were hit by that. We're a trading country, so the collateral damage was huge. All eyes turned to Hank Paulson to see what the U.S. government would do next. He was not always clear about his intentions. He, 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 I don't know if you if you if you read it yet, but we there there was we, we had said that we uh, we won't. He's not very articulate. He has a hard time explaining what he's doing. He seems to be very impulsive. He's constantly on the phone barking orders. He's impatient. He drives his people very hard. He understands very quickly how severe the financial problems are. But I think he muddles the message in ways that may make it worse, because it's very confusing. He says one thing and does another, and then he changes his mind again. Paulson's ability to reverse directions came to the fore in the next crisis he confronted, the near collapse of the world's biggest insurance company, AIG. 
it emerged that the dealings of one obscure executive at AIG threatened the entire world financial system. His name was Joseph Cassano. Cassano lived in the most exclusive neighborhood in London, England. Every morning at 7 a.m., the 53-year-old American executive would hop on his bicycle for the short trip to the office. He may have dressed like a bike messenger, but in fact he was the head of the financial products division of AIG. He had moved to London because the kind of trading he did was banned in the United States. Cassano would insure companies against the failure of their business partners. It was a very risky thing to do. But in conference calls with investors, he claimed that it was a no-lose proposition. It's hard for us, with, and with, without being flippant, to even see a scenario that would see us losing one dollar in any of those transactions. Joseph Cassano's bet was that a lot of banks and mortgage companies around the world could never fail all at once. Of course, the downside was that if for any reason those products started to misperform, if the housing market crashed in a way that people hadn't seen in living memory, then of course AIG would face a very big bill. But Cassano, like many traders, didn't worry too much about that. And the terrible truth was that inside AIG, very few people other than Cassano himself and his particular unit had any idea what AIG financial products was up to. In September 2008, when many banks around the world began collapsing, Cassano's risky insurance scheme pushed AIG to the edge of bankruptcy. Hank Paulson was quick to deny that he had any intention of stepping in to save AIG. The truth was that the company's desperate financial situation came as a complete shock to the Treasury Secretary and all regulatory agencies in the United States. Total surprise, uh, which is a complete indictment of the financial regulatory system. How can you be surprised by something that is so big and so dangerous that if it gets in trouble, you have to spend hundreds of billions of taxpayers' money to put it out of its misery? Nobody knew just how big a casino AIG was running. Reality was that AIG was such a monstrous creature with tentacles in so many parts of the financial system that if you had let AIG go down, you really would have been risking dragging the wider Western financial system with it. In the end, Paulson bowed to the inevitable and saved AIG with $85 billion of taxpayer money. Well, I think there was this sense of shock that AIG was being saved. I think also a sense of relief. I, I do think that at that point, people didn't realize how bad things really were, but thought that, boy, if AIG went, we would be in a lot more trouble. Can I ask you a question, please? Joseph Cassano was fired by AIG. But he walked away with $315 million. Sorry, we have no comment. Thank you. On Thursday, September 18th, U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson went to ask congressional leaders for more powers and several hundred billion dollars to staunch the bleeding. The meeting took place in the office of the most powerful woman on Capitol Hill, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Good evening. I'm very pleased to welcome the Democratic and Republican leadership of the House and Senate, as well as the... Bernanke speaks first. And, you know, Fed chairmen are usually kind of careful about predicting doom and gloom because if they say they're going to be showers, everybody assumes it's going to be a hurricane. And he comes in and says, it's going to be a hurricane. He says that if you don't put some money up, taxpayer money to bail out the financial system, we'll have another Great Depression. And most of the members of Congress there are just completely stunned. Harry Reid, the majority leader, the senator from Nevada, says to him, well, how long do we have? And Bernanke says, a couple of days. And Harry Reid says, the Senate of the United States does not flush a toilet in a couple of days. They really thought they were staring at the economic abyss. That's what was in front of them. And, you know, we focus so much on Lehman Brothers and AIG, but it was those next dominoes. It was Morgan Stanley going. It was Goldman Sachs going next. And go after that, we were talking about General Electric, an American icon. 
Hank Paulson's telephone log showed that he was receiving calls from the head of almost every major corporation in America. Many of them, like Jeffrey Immelt of General Electric, worried that bankruptcy was just around the corner. Paulson realized that he had to pump government money into the financial system to allow banks to resume lending to consumers and to each other. He came up with a plan called TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. The government would strengthen U.S. banks using taxpayer money to buy their questionable assets. We gotta get this up to the hill quicker. We gotta keep it simple, very simple. The proposal was not well received. Hank Paulson, who wasn't very good at dealing with Congress at the best of times, turned up with a very thin um, proposal of a similar kind to recapitalize the banks, but it wasn't well prepared. It was only 10 pages long, whereas most bills in Congress are seven or 800 pages long. There was no account about how the money would spend, and Congress turned down the plan. They didn't like it. You see, what has been holding up the deal... Ohio Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur voted against the bailout. I saw it as a means for Wall Street to take a very gun-shy Congress a few weeks before election and strike the fear of God into them and get anything you wanted out of them and essentially transfer all of the losses that they knew were happening to the public sector. No, Mr. Paulson, we're not going to do what you're asking us to do. The vote did not turn out as Hank Paulson expected. On this vote, the yeas are 205, the nays are 228. The motion is not adopted. The bailout package was defeated today. Stocks fell off a cliff, the largest single point drop in history. In the end... Well, they were horrified. They thought that they had made the case that we were on the cusp of another Great Depression, and they couldn't believe that Congress wouldn't approve the money. They were stunned. Um, and it was... It made the crisis worse because it made everybody wonder whether our political system had its act together. Hank Paulson said he never felt worse than when his proposal was voted down, and he began to show it. One of the sort of physical reactions he has is he does these sort of dry heaves. It's sort of almost a nervous, uh, emotional, tired, it, it, it's his form of sickness, if you will. There's a moment when he goes to the Hill. He's trying to convince these congressional members to pass TARP. And that evening, you know, they, they bring him a trash can. And then they say, do we, should we get the, you know, the congressional doctor to come? And he says, no, no, this, this happens to be a lot. Paulson's international colleagues could see that he was under enormous pressure. Il a été euh, sous des moments de stress exceptionnel, sans aucun doute. J'ai le souvenir précis d'une conversation téléphonique que je souhaitais avoir avec lui sur AIG et, et où il m'a dit euh, « je prends ton appel mais j'ai 15 secondes ». Et je, je veux bien le croire, on était dans des, dans des, dans des périodes de, 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 de temps extraordinairement courts pour des enjeux énormes. Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson warned congressional leaders that if they did not get sweeping new powers and $700 billion, there was a serious chance of another Great Depression. In the end, they got the powers and the money, but the signs of depression started appearing anyway. In the last few months of 2008, signs of economic depression appeared in many parts of the United States. There were over one million home foreclosures, the greatest share in California. Two years later, the foreclosure rate is still increasing. What he, do, what he doesn't get right now, he can get from... Deputy Mark Haybaker of the Sacramento Sheriff's Department used to enforce only one or two foreclosures a month. Now he has 20 to 30 a week. The owner here had poor health and no insurance, and so lost everything. Good luck, you folks. Huh? All right, you all right. Good. Take care. Don't move to California. That's all I got to say. Construction worker John Kesnick is helping the family move out on the foreclosure deadline, piling their belongings onto the sidewalk. He too has been out of work for months. Hey, there's no one's no one's buying any houses. Hmm. What's happening to the California dream? Yeah. Okay. It used to be good here. It ain't no more. Here we go, guys. Sheriff Haybaker has one of the toughest jobs in the state. He often has to forcibly remove people 
and sometimes even has to draw his weapon. He is haunted by the case of one older man who was not going to listen to reason. Hello? Sheriff! And he continually called the bank and made threats to them. The bank made me uh, aware of this. I showed up with another officer. Um, we approached the house and made entry into the house. And when we did, he, he shot himself, committed suicide. The living room was dark. He was sitting in the living room on a couch. Um, didn't leave a note for us, didn't leave any explanation at all. And um, he did pass away uh, the day after that. His family had probably lived there his whole life, and the bank took his house. And he probably felt that he had nowhere else to go. After being foreclosed, many former homeowners have no place to go and fall into despair. Some have to sleep in their cars. Single mothers Nicole O'Connor and Audrey Schreibner have just found places in the St. John's Women's Shelter in Sacramento. Both had been living in their cars for weeks with their children. Audrey has also been battling cancer. I've been working since I was 15, so you know, I have a lot of history, but physically, I'm just not up to it, you know, right now. And so for the months before I came here, me and the two kids were living out of my van. Yeah, and that's scary. Not many places you could park a car overnight. That's being a woman you gotta, by you know, yourself. You've got security yeah. running around going, uh, you're not supposed to park here. It's like, well, where are I supposed to go? And you know, you're a single woman pregnant, seven months pregnant, and you're like, where do I go? Where do I go? I'm not, I don't, not used to living on the street. Because I didn't know where to turn. You just cry. You're in a small, you know, small van, and you just want to cry all night, and you just, you just don't know where to turn. Under government pressure, California banks and mortgage companies hold events like this one in San Diego. Homeowners facing foreclosure are offered one last chance. They line up to talk one more time with bank officials, but there is little room for negotiation. It is exasperating for homeowners like Jack, who did not wish to provide his last name. They don't do any favors for anybody. It's all about money. They don't care about people. They can send them home, make them homeless, put them in the street. They don't care if they're el elderly, disabled, people who lost their jobs or had a health condition or mental health condition. They could care less. They could care less. That's, it's only in America. Rob or feed the rich. That's how it is in America. The actions of banks during the financial crisis raised the ire of many U.S. politicians. They don't return your phone call or they put you through so many hoops that you, you get so confused that you just give up. And that's the whole idea, wear you out. Make it confusing, make it very intimidating, and you'll walk away. And then someone else ends up owning that property, not you. So you've lost everything that you've invested in. So Jenna Lady from Ohio rise. Marcy Kaptur went to the U.S. House of Representatives and told Americans to fight back against foreclosures, even by resisting the sheriffs. What I'm telling people right now is stay in your homes. If the American people, anybody out there is being foreclosed, don't leave. You be squatters in your own homes. Don't you leave in Ohio and Michigan and Indiana and Illinois and all these other places where our people are being treated like chattel. I would venture to say well over 75% of the people that get these notices from lending institutions have no clue about how to defend their own interests legally. It is just, it's a tragedy. On Monday, October 13th, 2008, as the U.S. economy was spiraling downwards, America's top bank CEOs were summoned to an emergency meeting at the U.S. Treasury Building in Washington. News cameras caught fleeting images of the arrival of Jamie Dimon of J.P. Morgan and Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs, John Thane of Merrill Lynch, and John Mack of Morgan Stanley. It was a holiday weekend, and the purpose of the meeting was kept secret from the participants. I, uh, David Attack. U.S. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson had decided the time had come for radical action. 
He intended to launch a virtual government takeover of the U.S. banking system by making direct government investments in all major banks. He knew that many bankers would be reluctant to accept. Paulson has a problem, which is basically the government of the United States can't force the banks to take this taxpayer capital. Um, he wants them to take it because he wants to put capital into the weakest banks and he wants the financial system to have more capital because if it doesn't have more capital it's going to shrink and that's going to hurt us all. So he has to use his uh, forcefulness to make them feel like none of them have a choice. And he does. The bankers knew that if they accepted the money they would also have to accept a lot more government interference in the way they ran their businesses right down to the size of their bonuses, something they desperately wish to avoid. In the end, each of the nine CEOs present signed a hastily drafted single sheet of paper. Ten billion dollars of government investment for Merrill Lynch. Ten billion for Goldman Sachs. Twenty-five billion dollars for J.P. Morgan. Two hundred and fifty billion in all. To Hank Paulson's own surprise, they capitulated much more quickly and easily than he ever imagined. Literally by four or five in the afternoon, it was done. Nice suit there, buddy. Try not to steal any more money. The biggest welfare check in history had been paid to Wall Street. Hank Paulson may have had sound financial reasons for doing what he did, but he had no idea what the public reaction would be. Protesters filled the streets, denouncing bailouts for billionaire bankers. Paulson is still under fire for his handling of the financial crisis. At congressional investigations, he is pressed about what exactly U.S. taxpayers got for their billions of dollars. Ohio's Marcy Kaptur is determined to hold him to account. Well, you know, I wish you'd gotten a better deal for the taxpayers. You sure, certainly got a good deal for a lot of your former clients. I think if you look at what the taxpayer is going to make on a number of these companies, it will have been good. But the biggest advantage to the taxpayer is what didn't happen and that we did not have a collapse. We did not have a double the number of foreclosures in Ohio. And oh, they're, they're happening, Mr. Uh, Mr. Paulson. You, you ought to come and visit us in Ohio and see the results of your handiwork. Well, I know how terrible it is. I'm just telling you it would have been worse. That's your best argument. That's not good enough. You probably don't agree there was a crisis. I agree That's it was a crisis of your making for very... For the gentlewoman's very time has expired. The economic collapse of 2008 quickly spread to Europe, and so did the rage against bankers and politicians. The two years since the financial meltdown have been marked by constant violent protests overseas. Police have fought pitched battles with demonstrators in London, in Italy and in Lithuania. Protests in Greece began with farmers and quickly spread to civil service workers and students, all of whom are facing severe funding cuts because of the meltdown. From the very start, European governments stumbled in response to the turmoil. Conflicts first appeared at this meeting in Paris on October 4, 2008. Banks in Britain and France had already started to collapse, but Europe's leaders couldn't agree on what to do about it. France's Christine Lagarde had proposed a European rescue fund for troubled banks, but Germany's Angela Merkel wanted nothing to do with bailouts of any other country's financial problems. In a closed session at the summit, Merkel sternly told President Nicolas Sarkozy, Every country must clean up its own shit. Ironically, that very day, a German mortgage lender suddenly needed a massive government bailout. And it was Merkel who had to write the check. A French newspaper quoted Sarkozy's gloating. Merkel told me each to his own shit, and then she ends up in it. Maybe the meeting failed, but it was not my failure. It was Merkel's. She fell into her own trap. 
the whole affair was not a great advertisement for European unity. Mais c'est pas un drame. C'est pas d'aujourd'hui que l'on ignore qu'il y a une culture anglo-saxonne, que, que l'Allemagne a sa propre organisation hollandaire, et que les pays méditerranéens peuvent avoir d'autres idées. Tout le monde le sait. Et vous savez, l'Europe, c'est 27 pays souverains. Ce ne sont pas des provinces. Ce sont des pays avec leur souveraineté, leurs drapeaux, leurs hymnes nationaux, leurs histoires respectives qui ont souvent été en guerre les uns avec les autres. Et cette Union européenne qui est un véritable miracle euh, depuis sa constitution, euh, elle, elle, elle fonctionne de manière cohérente, consensuelle, cohésive. Euh, mais elle ne fonctionne pas comme un seul homme sous une fédération euh, comme pourraient fonctionner les États-Unis ou, ou le Canada par exemple. We now know that the only thing that really unified the European powers was anger at the United States. A tug of war played out behind closed doors when world finance ministers descended on Washington to confront the Americans in the first week of October 2008. That critical meeting was chaired by Hank Paulson. Hank started the meeting by saying, uh, you know, we're in a bad situation here. We have banks failing in the United States, banks failing in the United Kingdom. Uh, some of the regional banks in Germany had failed. It was unclear that the markets would even open on the Monday, and we better deal with this. And that's a sobering conversation. French Finance Minister Christine Lagarde admits anti-American feelings were running high. Ce qui est certain, c'est que les dérèglements financiers à partir d'un marché, le marché américain, et qui a son origine dans une bulle immobilière considérable, a déréglé l'ensemble des circuits financiers et a précipité l'ensemble de nos économies dans le monde en situation très difficile. The reaction of the Europeans is, uh, for the most part, is very aggressive, uh, very accusatory of the United States. You caused this because you let Lehman Brothers fail. I didn't think it was particularly useful. I mean, and I pointed out to. Some of my colleagues, a lot of the European banks were leveraged at 30 to 1 and 40 to 1, so they couldn't really be too critical of investment banks on Wall Street that were leveraged the same way. The G7 finance ministers met President Bush the next day at the White House. He acknowledged that the United States bore the chief responsibility for causing the crisis and promised that the U.S. would change its ways to help clean up the mess. The finance ministers left the White House with a new plan that was agreed to by all G20 finance ministers, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. So by Saturday night, everybody in the financial world that had anything to say in government or in the central banks had endorsed the plan. I think actually that's quite positive news in, in terms of, of world government. Former Canadian Prime Minister Paul Martin says world leaders were struggling with how the game of international finance had changed. The best example, I think, in many ways is, uh, you know, is this person buys a house uh, in California, pays twice as much as the, he can afford and twice as much as the house is worth on the basis that the, the value of the house is going up. He gets a subprime mortgage uh, and it defaults. And what happens as a result of his default, Asian markets cr crater and municipalities in northern Nor Norway are declaring bankruptcy. That is an interconnectedness which I don't think anybody fully understood. Far from the corridors of power, some countries were immediately devastated by the global financial collapse. Iceland was headed for bankruptcy and ruin. During the meltdown, the worst international dispute over money came between Britain and Iceland. Iceland flew higher and crashed harder than almost all other countries. In the boom years, Iceland had privatized its banks. The new owners embarked on a binge of questionable financial practices. Many Icelanders thought they had developed a world-beating new banking model. But the global financial collapse would prove them wrong. Egil Helgesen is Iceland's most popular political broadcaster. Suddenly, a small country with no history of banking, no history of stock markets, thought that they knew best. Uh, even its own record from the Icelandic Chamber of Commerce saying, uh, 
of course, the Scandinavian countries cannot teach Iceland anything because we are cleverer than them. In the years leading up to the crisis, Icelandic banks opened operations in London and launched major ad campaigns to convince British citizens to deposit their money in high-interest Icelandic accounts. Credit cards, club cards, discount cards, frequent flyer cards, ridiculous! The actor John Cleese became a pitchman for the Kupthing Bank. So all you Icelanders have got this figured out. I say, right. Icesave was an internet deposit scheme run by Landisbank. Because Icesave's an online savings bank, completely dummy proof. Not quite. In October 2008, Iceland's banks quickly collapsed and had to be taken over by the government. Prime Minister Ger Harda went on national television to announce that the country was facing bankruptcy and ruin. So, Hætta er unverulega, góðir landsmenn. The UK government immediately demanded that Iceland guarantee British deposits in Icelandic bank accounts. Already facing bankruptcy, Iceland refused. British Prime Minister Gordon Brown was furious. What happened in Iceland is completely unacceptable. I, I've been in touch with the Icelandic uh, Prime Minister. I've said that this is effectively illegal action that they've uh, taken. Uh, we are freezing the assets of uh, Icelandic companies in the United Kingdom. Britain invoked its draconian anti-terrorism legislation and placed Iceland and Landesbank on its official list of proscribed organizations. Icelanders couldn't believe it. You have the Al-Qaeda, you have the Taliban, you have North Korea, and you have the uh, Landsbanki of Iceland, the Financial Ministry of Iceland, and the Central Bank of Iceland. So when you're on this list, you have no chance. So whatever credibility there's left, it's gone. Icelanders were very upset that Gordon Brown had categorized them as terrorists. Well, we, we basically think, think he's a bastard. We consider Britain a, a friendly country. The problem we got was um, that we understood the then Icelandic government to be saying to us that uh, the creditors outside Iceland weren't going to get anything, and you know we, we couldn't, we just couldn't sit back and allow that to happen. I think the the, the application of uh, ter of legislation that was intended to deal with terrorists against a friendly country, an old ally, NATO ally, uh, was absurd. This would never, never, have been done. Uh, had they been dealing with a more powerful country than Iceland. Yeah, I think uh, there was nothing about bullying Iceland. I mean, Iceland had allowed these banks to develop and to ruin themselves and ruin the country. Things are clearly tough for our US and our global viewers, but look on the bright side, you could be in Iceland. Iceland, a new bank has been placed under the state of the state today. It's the The financial system there teetered on the brink of collapse today. The scale of the crisis, the government's taken out these four-page ads, reminding people to remember their loved ones, to think of their children. This is also sort of a, the end of the, an illusion that has sort of collapsed. Because for a while everybody thought that they would be living in a famously rich society where everybody was moving around money. And we have to sort of reinvent ourselves as a nation. The financial meltdown triggered an epidemic of unemployment around the world. Perhaps the most astonishing collapse was in China. The interconnectedness of the world economy became starkly apparent in late 2008 in China. Kaohsiung is China's textile capital and was among the first places to be hit by the full impact of the global financial crisis. The story begins with Tao Shulong, the millionaire owner of this textile plant in Shaoxing. Tao's factory employed 4,000 workers in an industrial compound that covered the size of several football fields.
Cal drove around town every day showing off his latest Mercedes, and he was widely seen here as an advertisement for the new China. Unfortunately, in the fall of 2008, international orders for clothing from Tao's factories dried up all at once. Foreign customers told him they couldn't even pay for the shipments he had already exported. Tao quickly became desperate. He had no cash reserves to pay his workers, and there was no way under Chinese law that he could file for bankruptcy protection from his creditors. And so late one night in October, Tao sold his Mercedes, burned the financial records of his companies, and disappeared into the night. Tao wasn't the only one. Dozens of Chinese factory owners did exactly the same thing. There was a wave of bankruptcies in the Chinese industrial sector in late 2008, and millions of Chinese workers were suddenly thrown onto the street. Many textile and toy factory workers were owed months of wages. We just want to be paid what we deserve, and we are not asking for anything that we do not deserve. The thing to remember about Chinese uh, industry and Chinese companies is that they're highly reactive and responsive. You think these are companies that can turn around a toy design and make it an export before Christmas, you know, sometimes in a matter of weeks, and they're the, exactly the same. When orders start falling off, they close very quickly, and there is sort of instant reaction to lack of profitability, which is fire all the workers. It's, it's a very brutal form of capitalism. Someone got on the roof to jump, this woman says, but the police just said, go ahead. Other workers reveal they haven't eaten for two days. Han Dong Fang is a labor activist in Hong Kong who hosts a hotline radio show devoted to workers' rights. He says China's labor unions were of no help to the laid-off workers because those unions operate as virtual branches of the government. They never thought how to represent the workers, how to help the workers. So therefore, everything they react in a way that the workers don't really need. By Christmas 2008, there were an estimated 15 million unemployed workers in China. Thousands of factories had closed suddenly. Demonstrations broke out in several cities. Some police cars were overturned. Millions of angry workers demonstrating in the streets is about the worst nightmare for China's communist government. The interesting thing is that the Communist Party was extremely worried that that might happen. And it's always worried because its legitimacy, the legitimacy of the Communist Party of China, depends absolutely on delivering economic growth. And if you talk to Communist Party officials, they will admit that. They'll say, look, if we don't deliver economic growth, there's nothing else, because we're clearly not really communist anymore ideologically. We have an essentially capitalist economy. And if we don't make it work, then we are the ones to blame and therefore we have to keep delivering economic growth. So they're very sensitive about any form of unrest. The 2008 demonstrations echoed the notorious Tiananmen uprisings of 1989, when Chinese citizens lost their fear of dictatorship and stood up to the communist government. Han Dong Fang was a leader of the Tiananmen protests, but speaking from experience, he urged workers not to participate in the violent demonstrations of 2008. One of the lessons I learned from 1989, the huge, massive street action, uh, looks powerful, yes, but uh, after the crackdown, everybody disappeared. We're human beings, and you know, we have fear in front of machine guns. Even a million people in the street continue for three days uh, that power is not really reliable. The Chinese Communist government quickly suppressed the demonstrations there. But by the end of 2008, workers around the world joined the global protest against the economic devastation brought on by the financial meltdown. In Iceland, demonstrators pushed for the overthrow of the government. 
In France, some bosses were kidnapped and held hostage by angry employees. The victims of the crisis were fighting back. The years since the 2008 collapse have been marked by demonstrations around the world. Owing to the loss of an estimated 30 million jobs. In many places there were violent street protests, but they were easily weathered by governments and large corporations. In some countries, however, the struggle went much further and left a lasting mark. The epicenter of this battle was in France, where workers have always been quick to the barricades. Because of the meltdown, in March 2009, the Continental Tire Company announced that it would be forced to close its factory in the town of Clairois, cutting 1,120 jobs. The plant was still showing a profit, but according to the factory boss, Louis Forzy, the workers here were just not as motivated and productive as they should be. Selon moi, et c'est les chiffres qu'il montre, nos résultats sont inférieurs à ceux des autres usines. Continental workers labeled for Z a thief and a liar. They convened a meeting at the plant to organize a protest. J'ai supprimé ma fille de famille pour Continental. C'est honteux. Forzi showed up to address them. He made a show of his patience and forbearance. Until an egg in the head changed his mind. He immediately decided that perhaps he had underestimated the situation and made a tactical withdrawal from the field of battle. Why did that happen? Why? Because uh, people were shocked, they were angry. Je pense aussi qu'il était au courant depuis longtemps qu'il allait y avoir une fermeture du site. The Continental employees moved on to occupy the town offices. Le bureau de sous-préfet, c'est où Wow, vous êtes avec nous, vous êtes avec les continues, madame, là, quand même When union leader Xavier Mathieu received news that a judge refused to grant them an injunction to stop the plant closing, he and the workers began trashing the place. sans se défendre, c'est clair et net. Le désespoir des gens qui sont foutus dehors, c'est pas de la cruauté ça, c'est pas de la violence, si c'est de la violence, il n'y a pas que la violence physique dans la vie, il y a la violence morale aussi. Moi je suis fier de ce que les mecs ils ont fait aujourd'hui, et n'attendez pas. The worker uprising began to spread across the country and became increasingly threatening. The Caterpillar Heavy Equipment Company in Grenoble announced that, in spite of record profits, they would be cutting 20,000 jobs worldwide, over 700 here in France. The global meltdown would reduce demand for their bulldozers, and so production would have to slow down. On March 2nd, workers surrounded the plant. They were following the instructions of union leader Pierre Picaretta, who, like his father before him, has worked his whole life at Caterpillar. On est des humains, 
Et on n'accepte pas, là, tête baissée, cette économie qui, 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 qui nous fait souffrir. Donc on ne pouvait pas accepter comme ça euh, le fait d'annoncer des bénéfices records et de licencier les personnes. Oh, venez, les gars, vous faites quoi, là Three weeks of negotiations led nowhere. Furious workers surrounded the management offices and decided to hold the management team captive. The first union leader on the scene was Nicolas Benoit. Ce coup-là, les patrons ne sont pas partis, donc on les a obligés à venir à la table des négociations pour discuter. Ils ont refusé, donc euh, les salariés ont dit tant que, tant que vous ne reprenez pas des négociations qui soient des négociations sérieuses, vous restez là. Nicolas Polotnik led the management team that was taken prisoner. At first, he refused any further discussions with the union. With the Caterpillar bosses held captive, the situation became increasingly dangerous. The police did not immediately intervene. The union leaders were trying to keep control of the situation. The media were then told that the bosses would be staying the night. Overnight, as the captive bosses were trying to get some sleep in their offices, angry workers did not leave them in peace. The Caterpillar kidnapping incident made news around the world. It was widely described as boss napping. In the French Alps, at the U.S. tractor company Caterpillar, where managers were locked in and stripped of their speakerphone. Boss napped all night. President Nicolas Sarkozy realized this extreme reaction to the global meltdown was turning into a public relations disaster for France. He went on national television to denounce the kidnappers. Privately, however, French finance minister Christine Lagarde was critical of Caterpillar management. She thought that the situation was exacerbated by the ham-fisted tactics of the American company, a common problem with foreign-owned firms. On a souvent constaté dans des entreprises sous capitaux étrangers que le dialogue n'était pas aussi, aussi riche et aussi développé parce que, parce que le centre de décision est ailleurs. After an anxious night, Caterpillar management agreed to resume negotiations. In exchange, the union allowed the bosses to leave the plant, although there were some tense moments on the way out. Pierre Picaretta tried to claim victory. Je pense que le message est passé et je crois que rapidement dans les jours qui vont suivre, ça va lâcher, ça va lâcher fortement. The Caterpillar bosses who were kidnapped decided to keep silent about their ordeal. But many bosses in France realized they could soon end up in a similar predicament. One of them was Marcus Cariou, the human resources manager for a U.S. car parts company called Molex. He was sent into the town of Villemur, near Toulouse, to close a Molex factory that had operated here for many years. The workers were furious, and very quickly their anger focused on Cariou. Along with nasty graffiti, Cariou says he became the target of email threats. You know, when you read about uh, some extremists, you know, saying that, uh, that uh, people like me should be exterminated, you know, so it's, I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's shocking to, to see that. The town of Villemur would be hard hit by the closure of the Molex plant, which represents 20% of its tax revenues. The local parish priest, Philippe Bachet, 
led the community support effort for the Molex workers. Et tous ceux qui se sont mobilisés doivent continuer à l'être pour que notre ville ne devienne pas un désert industriel. On the morning of April 20th, 2009, in Villemur, Marcus Carriou was consulting a security company about how to act in case he should be kidnapped. Ironically, that afternoon, union leader Denis Paris showed up and placed him in captivity. Et on veut 5 millions d'euros aussi pour préjudice. Et on lui a dit, bah, écoutez, maintenant vous allez nous donner les explications et on va vous garder avec nous pour euh, que vous nous donniez toutes les informations pourquoi vous avez fait ça. Within one hour, there were media all over the, the plant. I felt like an animal in a cage. The people there, they offered some food. They offered us some mattresses as well, so that we uh, could comfortably sleep in this office. The mattress was absolutely dirty, and also I was in touch with our, our security advisor. He said, well, you know, in uh, one out of two cases, they spit in the sandwiches, so I didn't want to touch that. After 26 hours, Marcus Cariou and his colleague Colin Kolbach were released from captivity. Even as they left, they felt threatened. You could see from people shouting and screaming that there was extremely heavy aggression there. My colleague, I mean, she, she came out and she was in tears afterwards because she didn't expect, uh, she had been working quite a couple of years with these people to, the, to react like this. In the end, the Molex company paid some extra compensation to the laid-off workers, but did not back down from closing the plant. The rage against Marcus Cariou only increased the point that he travels with bodyguards as he conducts final negotiations. Cariou complained that he was treated like a monkey in a zoo, but union leader Paris openly threatens him with much worse. Il n'est pas encore reparti, Cariou, s'il faut arriver à le séquestrer. Mais là, je parle de séquestration, il le traité comme un singe, on va y arriver. C'est fort possible que ça arrive aussi, d'ici la fin. Mais bon, euh, il verra la différence que, du traitement qu'il a eu et du traitement qu'il va avoir. Finance Minister Christine Lagarde has to walk a fine line about union militancy in France. She denounces violence and she knows that foreign companies don't like the turbulent atmosphere here. On the other hand, she points out that the people who have paid the greatest price for the global financial collapse are workers. Les actionnaires vont s'en sortir. Les cours de bourse remontent. En revanche, Ceux qui souffrent, ce sont évidemment euh, les effectifs des entreprises, puisqu'il y a des menaces de restructuration, puisqu'il y a des licenciements, puisqu'il y a des gens qui perdent leur job. Many in France believe that workers' fundamental rights have been violated in the wake of the financial crisis, and that workers here need to fight back. Les événements nous invitent à prendre position et à soutenir les causes justes. Father Philippe Bachet says that French workers give an example to the world by defining employment as an essential human right. Ce sont des gens qui n'acceptent pas facilement ce qu'on leur propose, ce qu'on leur fait faire. Et donc ils, ils, ils se raidissent et ils, ils, défendent, ils défendent à la fois leurs droits, c'est normal, ils essayent de défendre aussi euh, leur travail. Et le travail... C'est aussi très important pour l'homme. L'homme a besoin de travailler. Iceland was a microcosm of everything that went wrong during the global financial crisis. The sudden collapse of the country's banks in the fall of 2008 wiped out the pensions and savings of most Icelanders. Every citizen was now saddled with a debt estimated at $350,000 per person. Icelanders were furious at the greed of bankers and government cronyism that contributed to the meltdown. In early 2009, some took to the streets to express their dissatisfaction. First, they surrounded the national parliament, and protest leaders appealed to the public to come out and support them. 
I sort of wasn't very optimistic that we would be able to mobilize the people. But every week, every day, you got such shocking news that completely shook the foundations of, you know, your sense of what was moral. The immorality that was uh, exposed to us was so shocking that people started to come together. The Reykjavik police moved into position to protect the parliament. Inevitably, there were scuffles. Nothing like this had ever happened in Iceland, and both sides were unsure how to proceed. On January 21st, the anger focused on Icelandic Prime Minister Ger Harda. His car was surrounded and pelted with eggs and garbage. He was shaken by the incident, especially because it came shortly after a difficult visit to his doctor. When people were attacking my car, I had gotten the diagnosis the night before that I had had cancer. So uh, all, all of this in my memory is very, very vivid. I can understand why people were angry, particularly those who had lost money, who had lost their jobs. There was a, a crisis that nobody had really expected of enormous proportions. Icelandic poet and singer Hordur Torfason was the main protest leader. I said to the people, we are all angry, but use your anger as a positive force. Don't destroy, don't use violence, don't attack people, don't go to the homes of the politicians, because that's private. We can never use anger to, to destroy. Torfesson asked the crowd to go home and get their pots and pans, then come down and serenade the politicians in the parliament. When it was new for Icelanders, ordinary people to come out and, and do something sort of illegal, like uh, not obeying police orders and so forth. And in the end, it almost became tribal. There were so many people with pots and pans and homemade drums, and there was this beating and the fires outside the parliament. In a sense, it was sort of the unbearable lightness of being, to be there, to experience this within the nation, and to see the joy and experience the joy when we finally got what we wanted. On January 23rd, Icelandic Prime Minister Ger Harda addressed his countrymen on national television and announced that he was resigning due to illness. His governing coalition fell apart. National elections were called. The new government in Iceland was left to clean up the incredible mess left by the bankers and politicians who preceded them. Steingrimer Sigfusson became the new finance minister. Obviously the international crisis are hitting a lot of countries, but in Iceland it's probably uh, more painful than almost anywhere else, because uh, things were taking so, to such extremes in Iceland. This uh, neoliberal uh, privatization experiment uh, that was driven forward by greed and bad practices in, in business had a terrible ending and now we are paying the price and and like usually it's not the people that cause the problem that have to tie up tidy up afterwards many Icelanders feel they are living in the ruins of a collapsed society every night Reykjavik police see the symptoms like an upswing in domestic violence here a woman has called for help because her estranged husband has broken into her house and grabbed her baby in a fit of drunken desperation. The police calmly talk the unemployed man into giving up without a fight. Constable Stefan Einersen says police here are sympathetic with people who become despondent after they lose their jobs. 
we're just people like everybody else. We have mortgages and car payments we have to make. So we're in the same situation as everyone else. Protest leader Birgitta Johnsdottir was elected to the Icelandic parliament. I feel incredibly strange and at the same time I feel deeply honored to be trusted, to be in there. I will just carry on doing what I was elected to, to be sort of a, a bridge or a voice for ordinary people, for the grassroots movements within this building there. As a result of the meltdown, young people in Iceland used decades of high taxes and reduced social services to help pay off the debts run up by Icelandic banks. At this art college in Reykjavik, the students are multilingual, well-educated and mobile. And there is a great fear that a high proportion of them will just give up on Iceland and move to other countries. Korto Jabali is one who plans to emigrate. Uh, most of the people I know don't want to live here forever. They, they all want to leave. Like everyone. I don't, know why, I don't know one single person in my age that really wants to stay in Iceland. Yeah. Icelandic protest leader Horder Torfesson has resumed his career as a performer. He realizes that many of his countrymen are demoralized and that many young people want to leave. But he is quite sure that Iceland can still have a bright future. I think many of these people, if they go away and they see, they look around in the world and they start value, revaluing, or seeing what really they will come back. I travel the world, I've, I've, I've seen so many things that I think this society is a very good one and we have the opportunity to build it up. And I see signs of this beginning. People are really standing together and helping each other. In confronting the problems of a failed economy, Iceland at least has the advantage of a strong social safety net. The situation is much more difficult in what is being called the Western world's most surprising failed state, California. In the three months following the meltdown, there were an estimated one million foreclosures in the United States, sweeping many middle-class families into poverty. Tent cities began springing up across the country as the homeless desperately searched for somewhere to spend the night. This one suddenly appeared in a field in Sacramento, California, the capital of a state that was long considered America's richest. It was reminiscent of the tent cities that appeared in this area during the Great Depression of the 1930s. In those days, they were called Hoovervilles, after then U.S. President Herbert Hoover. Back then, homeless people camped along the banks of the Sacramento River at the edge of town. And again today, the homeless have pitched their tents in the exact same spot. It is a dangerous place because the river can suddenly overflow its banks and flood the area. Bill Diola says they have tried to camp in safer places in Sacramento, but were chased away. The camping law states that if you're inside the city limits, you cannot pitch a tent for more than 24 hours, you can't camp in one spot for more than 24 hours, even with written permission from the property owner. I'm two months homeless. This is all new to me. These guys lead me the way. Municipal officials in Sacramento quickly ordered the big tent cities dispersed and did everything in their power to drive the homeless out of their jurisdiction. Many were arrested or fined. The Harrelson family of Sacramento have been homeless for months. When debt overcame them, they sold their house and tried to move in with relatives, but it didn't work out. They are on bicycles now because they can't afford a car, which is sadly ironic, 
because Francis is a retired auto worker. I worked for General Motors for about 30 years. And then uh, I got an early, when they came out with the early retirements, I jumped on it. Thought it was a good deal. Didn't turn out to be. <laughs> the family has spent some nights camping beside the Sacramento River, which Angelina did not enjoy. <laughs> I'm a girly girl. I don't like bugs. I don't like dirt. And it gets really cold at night. And then being dark outside and knowing that there's critters around like skunks or raccoons terrifies me. The Harrelson's eight-year-old son, Joseph, attends the Mustard Seed School in Sacramento, a school specially for children who are homeless. We do recess, then we go in, we eat breakfast there, and we do a journal and deal well. And after the afternoon, we do math or science, just fun stuff to do. After the global financial collapse knocked so many families out of their houses and down below the poverty line, there are now over 1.5 million homeless children in the United States. This school is privately funded by a charity called Loaves and Fishes. It's not uncommon when the kids first come, you know, we have sack lunches that groups in the community have fixed for the kids, and um, a child will be eating her lunch and the teachers will notice that she's hiding food. Um, and when asked, um, that little girl will say, well, it's for my mother. I know she's going to be hungry. And for a child to be hiding food to take care of her hungry mother is not the way things should be. There's times where he gets really frustrated at us, and he'll tell us, why can't you just give us a home like other normal kids? I want my own room back. It breaks my heart when he gets frustrated like that. It really breaks my heart to have to sit there and tell him, you know, I'm sorry. More and more charity organizations are stepping up to offer food and clothing to the homeless, but the demand just keeps growing. Almost two years after the meltdown, unemployment and homelessness in California is still getting worse, not better. There are over 100,000 homeless military veterans in the United States, the greatest collection of them in the Los Angeles area. Many of them suffer from post-traumatic stress and other mental illnesses. One of them recently crawled into a dumpster in Santa Monica and burned himself alive. The L.A. County Jail now houses the greatest collection of mentally ill people in the country. The government here simply can't provide any other facilities or treatment for them. Please welcome the 38th governor of the state of California, Arnold governor Schwarzenegger. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger recently announced a new range of budget cuts, which will certainly make the situation even worse. But he remains optimistic. The power of California's innovators and entrepreneurs is still strong. We are still the shining city on the hill. I don't consider it by any means a failed state. Many of the governor's critics say he's turning California into a wasteland that resembles his famous Terminator movies. He doesn't see it. When I was doing movies, I enjoyed destroying everything. I mean, I uh, love blowing up buildings and love destroying cars and wiping out people and all those kind of things. So by the time the landscape was there, it was just everything was burning and everything was a wreck. But now when you turn on the news, you see the same thing when they talk about the economy. But the reality of it is, is it's not that bad. It is bad. Uh, we did go down with the economy, but uh, we're going to be okay in California. This debate is turning into a bit of a family feud for Republican Governor Schwarzenegger. He's married to Maria Shriver, whose family has long been associated with the Democratic Party. His brother-in-law, Bobby Shriver, is now the mayor of Santa Monica. He thinks California is a failed state. The optimistic side of the argument is the state's failed. Something radical needs to happen. The non-optimistic side, to me anyways, look, everything's going to be okay. 
when in fact it's not okay now, it's getting worse, and it could get a lot worse. You, if you're a disabled senior at home and someone comes and gives you your food and cleans your diaper once a day, that person's about to be fired. You're going to have to move out of your apartment into a nursing home where you don't know anybody in order to save $15 a day in California. The most creative, smartest group of people in America can't figure out how to finance that. That's a failed situation. This is absolutely outrageous. It's, it's... Many people believe that Canada was largely spared by the global financial crisis. The people of Windsor, Ontario, don't feel that way. In the spring of 2010, the residents of Windsor, Ontario, come to a picnic to say goodbye to the General Motors Corporation. It's a bittersweet occasion. The company is bringing its 90-year history in this city to an end with the closure of its last plant here. The last 500 GM workers in Windsor are losing their jobs and joining the list of workers around the world who have been hurt by the meltdown. The auto industry has been among the worst hit. At its height, General Motors employed 7,000 workers in Windsor. But today, GM says there is just not enough work to keep this transmission plant open. As 49-year-old Ray Samard spends his last days on the assembly line, he has fond memories of the day he walked in the door in 1981. As a child, I visited the plant as a young boy, I always said, I'm going to work at General Motors. And I got the job, and I was ecstatic. It's a beautiful thing, working for the biggest corporation in the world. Many of these auto workers started young and followed the same path as their fathers and grandfathers. Many assumed they had jobs for life and don't really know how to do anything else. It came as a total shock when GM advised them in May 2008 that this plant would be closing for good. It's a sad day. I, I'm not... When I started, people left a job for me so that I could retire. I'm going to retire, and I'm not leaving a job for my children. That's disheartening. It really is. You feel a bit somehow responsible for that? Or? Sure, sure. We all do. We all have to take responsibility for that. At the height of the financial crisis, it looked as if General Motors would not be the only major casualty in the automobile sector. Chrysler was headed for bankruptcy as well. The Chrysler minivan plant in Windsor employs over 4,300 workers. Canadian federal and provincial politicians were summoned to an emergency meeting at Chrysler headquarters in Detroit. Ontario's Minister of Economic Development and Trade was there, Windsor's Sandra Popatello. They sat down with us and started talking about what their condition really was, and it was, uh, it was very frightening to hear. And um, I guess being from Windsor, being brought up here, m most of our lifeblood has been from the automotive sector. I thought I would never see the day that I would hear or get a sense that this could collapse. At the height of the 2008 crisis, executives from the big three U.S. auto companies came to Washington to ask for a massive government bailout. Famously, they all arrived in private corporate jets. There was a wave of revulsion from politicians and workers. Who do you think you are? You're asking for $50 billion and you, you fly in on a corporate jet? Those are our profits as well. As workers, every worker, I know at our plant, they said, you've got to be kidding me. The U.S. government came up with the bailout money and Canada quickly followed suit. Canadian Finance Minister Jim Flaherty is the member of parliament for Oshawa another riding that depends on the automotive sector. 
discussions have taken place about this. this he points out that there were many jobs at stake in Canada beyond those at the big three U.S. car companies. The fundamental challenge was this, were we going to be in the auto business or not? And the big driver, from my point of view, was the fact that we have three of the largest global parts companies in the world, in Canada. And that's where most of the techno technological innovation is. So we lose Chrysler, we lose General Motors, they continue in the United States and Europe and elsewhere, we're going to lose those parts companies too because they'll have to follow them. This is absolutely outrageous. It's, it's, One group of workers in Windsor decided to fight back against their plant closing. The incident came at the Aradco car parts plant, which manufactured stamped metal components for Chrysler. In March 2009, workers were called on a Monday night and told to stay home. The American-owned plant was shutting down. Aradco workers realized that their management was trying to sell all the equipment and sneak off without paying any kind of settlement to employees, some of whom had worked for decades and were owed thirty or forty thousand dollars. Not today, motherfucker! Go home! They decided to stop trucks that were arriving to empty out the plant. Then, when management still refused to negotiate with them, the workers occupied the plant. Isn't it pathetic when our guys have got to go to this length? we got to stand in a building and take over a building to get our point across. Among the union leaders standing on the roof was Jerry Farnham. Some of the workers here have decided to take over the plant. That's the only thing they have in order to try to get the monies that are owing to them. Sir, they have the right to refuse your entry. Okay, that's what they're doing. The battle moved on to a downtown hotel where Aradco's parent company was trying to hold an auction to sell off the equipment inside the plant. Keep going. Oh, the workers were able to mobilize to disrupt the proceedings. There were a few tense moments until the police finally intervened. I assure you and I guarantee you that there will be no auction today. That's my promise. It turns out that the American owners of this plant were already fugitives from justice. Aradco was operated by a California company called Catalina. The company website, now defunct, shows the name Gregory Willis as chief executive officer. This Michigan document shows that a few weeks before the plant was closed, Catalina's owners took the precaution of officially dissolving the company. The same owners had played the same game in 2006 in France. There as well, the plant was closed, the workers occupied it, but in France the owners were tried and convicted of breaking French law. In Windsor, union leader Jerry Farnham says that Canada has similar laws, but they are not enforced. Our government doesn't have the balls <laughs> to step up to the plate and go after what they, what's rightfully owed to the workers. And the, and the reality of the day, this part here really pisses me off because of the fact that the, the government has laws in place, but they're not being enacted on at all. These guys are, are heroes. In the end, Chrysler stepped in and paid the workers about a quarter of what they were owed and so the Aranco occupation ended. Unfortunately, only a handful of them have been able to find work in other plants. This is a nice truck, eh? Did you see For that? Ray Samard, forcibly retired from GM at age 49, the future looks a little scary. He realizes that he is unlikely to find a new career that pays anything like the auto industry, but he is ready to make the best of it. I still have young children that I need to put through university, so... There will be a change in, in, in my work employment. I'm not sure exactly what, what door is going to open for me yet. I'm, I'm still, my dad was a carpenter and I may have to pick up my tool belt again. That's a possibility. The most devastating effects of the financial collapse are being felt in the countries that flew the highest during the global real estate boom. In Spain and in Dubai.
Most workers around the world had little way to fight back against the effects of the meltdown. During the boom years, Spain was called the miracle of Europe. No more. At 6 a.m. every morning at the Plaza Elliptica in Madrid, immigrant workers from many countries line up and hope to be picked for a day's work by small contractors who drive by. With unemployment at 20 percent, they were the first to lose their jobs. The Spanish government recently offered to pay immigrants to go back to where they are from. Few took up the offer. Suleiman from Mali says he will hold on here in hopes that things will improve. But he sees no evidence that will happen. The real estate crash in Dubai has been even worse for the army of construction workers who came here from India and Pakistan and all over South Asia. They are paid on average $3 a day. Many of them have been thrown out of work. Many have not been paid for months. There were 200,000 laborers at once here. Um, and the practice is such that if you want to come to Dubai as a laborer, you just don't apply. You actually go to your home city in Bangladesh or somewhere in Karachi and pay a middleman money. So you're buying yourself a visa, okay? And, and while you're working, you're actually paying back maybe your prepaid visa rights through the first year. Um, so imagine if those guys didn't get paid for two or three months. Some of these workers went on strike demanding back pay. Dubai authorities started rounding up unemployed workers and forcibly expelling them from the country. For many, it is unclear whether it is worse to stay or to go home. Because many of them had to take on debt in their home country in order to get to Dubai to pay for their visas and sponsorship, they're, act they're actually going to go home either at a loss or, in the worst case, indebted to money sharks in their home country. So in many ways, they're the biggest losers of the Dubai crisis. As the grim toll of the financial crisis continues to mount around the world, many governments are looking for the true causes of the meltdown. In many cases, what they are finding is criminal. The search for the causes of the global financial meltdown has led to some evidence of fraud and corruption. In the city, the financial district of London, England, during the boom, the wild partying and flaunted excess of the banking world became legendary. Then a deep throat appeared, someone who was telling tales out of school that could get everyone in trouble. City Boy was an anonymous column that appeared in a small local newspaper and soon attracted a wide following. Eventually, City Boy was revealed to be the 35-year-old, extremely successful investment banker, Garrett Anderson. I would focus on false rumors, I'd focus on uh, drugs and uh, strip joints, sexism, racism. I would tend to focus on the less salubrious sides of the city because I wanted people... To, well, I suppose those are the things that were causing me stress and grief and making me feel rather dubious about my job and so I, I wanted to just relieve me to go into the confessional and, and tell everyone about it. City Boy's revelations included what he saw as widespread immoral and even criminal behavior in London's financial world. He says traders would regularly conspire to circulate false rumors about a company in order to drive its stock price up or down depending on the bets they had placed. He says that every day traders were feeding each other inside information that would allow them to illegally profit from deals. And that mentality was all pervasive. Insider trading, the spreading of false rumors, was becoming more and more prevalent. It was basically a genuinely a Wild West casino. It was a get-rich-quick, 
the good times are going to stop rolling at any minute. We've got to make our money. And I found it quite disgusting in, in a way. I had a very religious background. My, my grandparents were missionaries. My father was a labor MP. Um, I was a hippie. What the hell was I doing in this world? The low-level fraud revealed in Britain was nothing compared to the behavior discovered at senior corporate levels in America. U.S. investigators, however, discovered that criminal behavior is hard to prove when it involves some of the most powerful people on Wall Street. The first two U.S. executives charged with fraud were Ralph Chiaffi and Matthew Tannen, who ran a giant hedge fund and America's fifth largest investment bank, Bear Stearns. They were among the top golden boys on Wall Street. But the failure of their investment fund in 2007 eventually led to the collapse of the bank. Investors lost billions. Investigators discovered that in March 2007, the two realized that their fund was melting down. Chiaffi emailed Tannen, The worry for me is that the subprime losses will be far worse than anything people have modeled. Meanwhile, Tannen bragged that he was still finding suckers to invest in a fund he knew was failing. Believe it or not, I've been able to convince people to add more money. They reminded me of the emails that we saw during the tech stock bubble where the analyst would go out and shill for some stock and then in an email tell his colleagues, this is crap. I think it's appalling that people who are making that much money and who are purport to be smarter than everybody else basically turn out to be nothing more than devious snake oil salesmen. At their trial, Chiaffi and Tannen hired a parade of high-powered expert witnesses to testify that their actions were not illegal. Just one of those experts, R. Glenn Hubbard, a former economic advisor to George W. Bush, was paid $100,000 for his testimony. The two were found not guilty, although they now face a raft of civil charges from the Security and Exchange Commission. The case was seen as a shocking demonstration of the power of Wall Street money. If we have a Wall Street bank that can afford a very, very clever litigators that have an awful lot of firepower behind them, uh, they can overwhelm the Securities and Exchange Commission, they can overwhelm other government agencies, they probably will. But that doesn't mean that they were playing the game straight. That doesn't mean that they were following the intention of the law. In recent months, a lot of investigators in the United States have focused on the richest investment bank, Goldman Sachs. The meeting of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission will come to order. In the hearings of the Congressional Commission examining the meltdown, Chairman Phil Angelides went after Goldman CEO Lloyd Blankfein for betting against his own customers in the market for complicated financial products. Do you believe that was a proper legal ethical practice? The short answer is, this is the practice of a market maker, and I would like to explain this. Blankfein claimed that his bank was just putting together deals, matching buyers who believed house prices were going up with sellers who believed house prices would go down. He argued it was completely normal for Goldman to take one side of that bet or lend money to the buyer or the seller. We provide the necessary liquidity as market makers to help ensure that buyers and sellers can complete their transactions and securities markets can function efficiently. Goldman Sachs was not merely matching buyers to sellers. They were actively creating products for sale into the marketplace with the Goldman Sachs imprimatur behind it. And I believe that carries with it responsibility. Lloyd Blankfein denied that responsibility. He said betting against his own clients was okay because all parties knew what they were getting into. I'm just gonna be blunt with you. It sounds to me a little bit like selling a car with faulty brakes and then buying an insurance policy on the buyer of those cars. Every I'm talking purchaser about betting against of an security. asset here is an institution, okay. probably professional only investors dedicated in most cases to this business. Representing pension funds who have the life savings of 
police officers, These teachers. are the professional investors who want this exposure. But that was immediately contradicted by evidence unwittingly provided by a young Goldman trader named Fabrice Tour. A U.S. Senate committee discovered emails in which Mr. Tour had bragged that he was selling to unsophisticated investors, or as he called them, widows and orphans that I ran into at the airport. Goldman Sachs has claimed that it had no idea that the U.S. housing market was destined to collapse. But way back in January 2007, Fab Tour wrote, The whole building is about to collapse any time now. Only potential survivor, the fabulous Fab standing in the middle of these complex, highly leveraged, exotic trades he created. Fabrice Tour and Goldman Sachs were charged with fraud by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. I deny categorically the SEC's allegations, and I will defend myself in court against this false claim. Got it? 105? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Senate Investigations Committee Chairman Carl Levin went after Tour's superiors at Goldman Sachs, reading other emails which indicated they knew they were selling faulty products to their own clients. June 22 is the date of this email. Boy, that Timberwolf was one shitty deal. How much of that shitty deal did you sell to your clients after June 22, 2007? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know the answer to that, but the price would have reflected levels that they wanted to invest oh, in. Oh, of course. They, but they don't know what's a You didn't tell them you thought it was a shitty deal. Well, I, I didn't say that. Come on, Mr. Sparks. Well, Mr. Chairman. Should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell, and by the way, it sold it, a lot of it after that date. Should Goldman Sachs be trying to sell a shitty deal? Well, can you answer again, that one? Can words, you answer that one, yes or no? I mean, we expect, I think, when we go into the hardware store or when we go into the toy store for our children that when we buy products that they're good products and that the people selling them stand behind them it's really the nature of responsibility in a society and an economy Goldman Sachs eventually settled its fraud case by paying an unprecedented 550 million dollar fine but several members of the U.S. Congress sent this letter to the Department of Justice, officially requesting a criminal investigation of Goldman and its senior executives. One of the reasons I'm interested in criminal proceedings is because you can go after their bank accounts. You can actually pry open, claw open their accounts, their personal accounts, their seven homes, their limousines, their yachts. You can go after, I'm looking for justice for the American people and how we're going to get the money back that our people are owed. Only two days after Goldman Sachs was charged with fraud, Chairman Lloyd Blankfein authorized a $5.5 billion package of new bonuses for his executives. That was somewhat galling to members of Congress who had seen the company benefit to the tune of several hundred billion dollars from the U.S. government bailout. Goldman Sachs was not a normal bank. It was a speculator in the market. How would it be if you went to Las Vegas and you gambled all your money away? And then at the very end you said, oh my goodness, my bad behavior should be rewarded, right? and you get the government of the United States to pay for your losses uh, in Las Vegas. That's a great deal. That's what he did. And they not only took their losses and gave them to someone else, they paid themselves bonuses for doing it. The search for fraud and corruption behind the meltdown was also underway in Europe, where some high-level con artists are going right back to business. In the boom years, Spain was widely referred to as the miracle of Europe. There were more houses built here than France, Germany, and several other European countries combined. But now we know there was a great deal of greed and corruption beneath the surface. Among the brightest stars of the real estate boom here was Francisco Hernando, a true Spanish success story. He lived a flamboyant lifestyle, surrounded by his motorcycle racing team, his corporate jets, 
and his private yacht. Not just any yacht, but a 236 feet long, costing $80 million, the biggest, most expensive yacht in Spain. In 2004, Francisco Hernando built what was supposed to be his crowning glory, near the town of Cesena, one hour south of Madrid, a giant condominium development the size of a small city. There were 89 buildings containing 13,000 apartments. The project was approved in record time. His town would bear his personal imprint, a community garden named after his wife, Maria Odena. And near the entrance, a 20-foot statue of his parents. It's a fiesta for me, for those who have bought the pieces, those who have confiado in me. At the gala unveiling of the project, Hernando was treated like a rock star by the Spanish media. Then a young reporter started to examine the story more closely. Everyone was saying, wow, that's great, that's wonderful, he's a self-made man. The problem is, when you dig deeper into the story, you discover that the project was approved in record time with no provision for things like water, roads, health facilities, all things that should be provided for families living there. It wasn't normal to see it approved with all these shortcomings. Alejandro Ramon soon discovered that the Sesenia project had been arranged with massive bribes to the mayor of the nearby town. The mayor was arrested. Journalists investigating Francisco Hernando's previous projects found a similar trail of corruption and bribery. He did not welcome this new brand of media attention. Today, Hernando's showcase development of Sesenia is a ghost town. Without all the proper hookups for water and sewage, very few people could actually move in. There is just one empty building after another, connected by deserted streets. Because of the meltdown, the market for condominiums has collapsed. Francisco Hernando has evaded prosecution because Spanish police have not yet been able to prove that he was the source of all the bribes. In a fit of pique, he announced that he's taking his business out of Spain and moving to Equatorial Guinea where he is already involved in another scandal. We've seen this guy do the same thing over and over now in different countries. I don't know if this guy knows how to do it any other way. Maybe that's just how he does things. Over the last two years, criminal investigations in Spain have resulted in dozens of arrests. In the city of Marbella, almost the entire town council stands accused of accepting bribes from real estate developers. Because of the meltdown, two-thirds of Spanish municipalities are now facing bankruptcy. The crash has been even more spectacular in a bigger real estate boomtown. In the years before the meltdown, Dubai had the biggest real estate bonanza in the world. Then the market here tumbled, losing 50% of its value, leaving Dubai virtually insolvent. You would think that would upset Dubai's supreme leader, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, but apparently not. In January 2010, Sheikh Mohammed threw this massive party to mark the opening of the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. Sheikh Mohammed calls himself Dubai's CEO. He always claimed that he ran his government according to strict business principles but now many are quietly questioning his judgment and his leadership. 
Well, I think when you portray yourself as the CEO of Dubai Inc., uh, if a company goes bust and disgraces itself and, and leaves a lot of people indebted, normally in order any restructuring, the CEO has to be uh, has to be replaced. The problem in a traditional monarchy or an autocracy in this case is that the CEO remains. Government and business officials in Dubai have followed the Sheikh's lead. At the top of the Burj Tower on the day it opened. I'm excited that uh, all of you are uh, the first group of people uh, to actually come uh, to the Burj at the top. Dubai's leading developer tried to portray the Dubai real estate crash as a good thing. Maybe values are changing, and that's good because the city at one point got to be too expensive. So I think that's good for the customers and that's good for the city. Moving through Dubai, you encounter a lot of evidence that things are not quite as rosy as the leadership pretends. This brand new $8 billion transit system was built by Japanese companies, but now the Dubai government can't pay for it. The Japanese are being offered a few cents on the dollar over a period of many years. Before the crash, Dubai was home to the world's greatest collection of building cranes. But now the construction sites have ground to a virtual halt. Many of these real estate developments have been spurred on by speculators who never intended to occupy the units, only to flip them for a profit. The government here did everything to encourage the scheme. To many critics, that was fraud. Dubai, in many ways, uh, with, with not to be too uncharitable, was uh, was a state uh, a state pyramid scheme, a state Ponzi. It relied on more people coming in to buy their properties or even the deposits of people who were who'd been there a little bit earlier than them, and it had to keep on going. The crash when it happened in Dubai was like a game of musical chairs coming to an end. The fools who were left with these half-finished properties, or in some cases patches of sand, were unable to sell on the premium because they were worthless by this stage. In the ultimate denial of reality, Dubai is moving right into its next real estate mega-project called The World. It is a series of islands off the coast, roughly in the shape of a world map. Developers are supposed to buy the islands and build their own tourist facilities on them. Austrian Joseph Kleindienst has bought the islands of Central Europe. The first island to be developed will be Germany. Joseph believes passionately in this project. His dream here includes hotels and condominiums to be used year-round by German tourists. Why would those tourists come here when the temperature in Dubai reaches 40 degrees Celsius, which it does for months at a time? Easy. Joseph says he's going to air condition entire streets. The R&D Institute from Germany, the Fraunhofer Institute, came up with an excellent idea to help during this time. We will build a 1.6 kilometer long boulevard climate controlled so that people can walk outside 12 months a year and enjoy, enjoy the climate controlled boulevard. Joseph's optimism seems hard to justify. The parent company of the World Project has announced that it cannot pay its debts to its many creditors. The international skepticism about Dubai is only growing, especially because the government here has been very secretive and even disingenuous about the state of its finances. Dubai's proposed island paradise with air-conditioned streets may be a harder sell than they imagine. I believe there were even plans to have refrigerated beaches in Dubai at one point. And I'm not sure in the post-credit crunch world that the smart money would be going to Dubai in quite that way anymore. Transparency, due diligence and sustainability will be the watchwords of the next decade and Dubai fails on all counts. I wouldn't feel particularly confident if I'd invested dozens of millions of dollars in purchasing these patches of sand. While Sheikh Mohammed tries to pretend that the meltdown never happened, other world leaders are trying to get to the root of the problem. There have been some very tough questions, including one from an unexpected source.
Queen Elizabeth has lived through the Great Depression, World War, and numerous financial collapses, but she found the 2008 meltdown especially troubling. A few weeks after the crash, she decided to make her first ever visit to the London School of Economics. For a few minutes, she made polite conversation with her hosts and then surprised them with a tough question about the financial crisis. If they were all so smart, why did nobody notice it coming? The staff at the LSE were somewhat flummoxed by the question and eventually wrote to the Queen that it was a failure of imagination. Martin Wolfe of the Financial Times of London, considered one of the foremost economic minds in Britain, has a more intriguing answer. You will never foresee these things because the system is ultimately just too complicated for anybody really to understand. The economy is an extremely complex uh, adaptive system. And in fact, I think it is the most complex system we know. It has the complexity of billions of people engaged producing billions of products over time and space. And they are people, and because they're people, they are subject to all the emotions of human beings, both euphoria and panic and all the rest of it, collectively and individually. Such a system will generate very complicated phenomena, and uh, it will often be very, very difficult to interpret them. The United States government is also searching for what went wrong. There is general agreement that it was a major failure of the U.S. regulatory system starting with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. The SEC was asleep at the switch. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation for much of the time was asleep at the switch. The Treasury for much of the time was asleep at the switch. But the drowsiness was all induced by this very, very powerful opiate called market fundamentalism. The idea that markets were basically perfect, they could do no wrong, that investors were smart, that smart investors would make all the inquiries they needed to make, that information was relatively and, revel and, 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 and easily available to everyone, uh, that therefore there could not be any problem. In Britain, the government regulator is the Financial Services Authority, which didn't do much better. They seemed easily foiled by legions of avaricious young smart elves. Basically, the attitude to politicians and regulators is hands off, we'll do our own thing. And of course, what we're trying to say there is let us abuse a system that is open to abuse so we can make vast amounts of money and um, please don't hassle us. The interesting thing is that when the good times are rolling, we say hands off, don't regulate us, stop having any involvement with us. And then as soon as we get in trouble, we come cap in hand and saying, actually, can you um, sort us out? So it's a, te it's a heads I win, tails you lose. Or as, as many people in Britain have said, we privatise the profits of the banks to a select few idiots like me, and we nationalise the losses to everyone, the idiots out there, <laughs> the civilians. French Finance Minister Christine Lagarde is playing a key role in the search for effective new financial regulations. You hear privately from businessmen a lot, governments can pass any regulation they want. We will always be able to outsmart governments and politicians in particular. Thieves and cops. Oui, c'est ça. C'est le gendarme et le voleur. Euh... C'est dans la nature humaine que d'essayer de contourner les obstacles. Quand on est un petit enfant et qu'on vous donne un interdit, vous essayez de voir comment vous pouvez passer à travers. Là, c'est la même chose. Le gouvernement fixe des règles et le monde des affaires se dit, bon, voilà les règles, voilà, il faudrait que je paye beaucoup de conseillers, de fiscalistes, d'avocats, de management en consultant, etc. De, pour, pour, pour contourner les obstacles. Il faut constamment être en... Outsmarting each other. Donc il faut, il faut constamment euh, anticiper la manière dont l'autre va essayer de contourner la règle pour améliorer la règle. Donc on est en travail permanent. In the United States, the quest for new financial regulations has been swayed by the deep pockets of Wall Street bankers. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what 
There was real anger at the banks after the meltdown and widespread demand to hold Wall Street accountable. We know the financial industry is spending Consider this. On Capitol Hill, Wall Street lobbyists outnumber elected politicians five to one. The politicians are surrounded and outgunned. Somehow, though, Wall Street claims that it lost out in the financial reform package eventually signed into law by Barack Obama. I would be very skeptical of all Wall Street claims that they failed in terms of this new financial package. Certainly they have an interest in making the public feel that they failed. And certainly members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, have an interest in making the public feel that they were very tough on Wall Street. That certainly is the rhetoric. But look carefully under the surface. Look at these 1,500 pages. Look at how many loopholes are still there. Wall Street came out exceedingly well. They lost the rhetorical contest. They won the regulatory contest. The search for new international financial regulation is proving equally difficult. It is being led by Dominic Strauss-Kahn at the International Monetary Fund. He was a longtime French finance minister and is considered a leading candidate to be the next president of France. The crisis also shows that some very risky behavior in the financial sector may put at risk the whole system. And uh, of course, it's in the nature of the banking system to take risks. That's why we have a banking system. That's fine. But there's a limit to the kind of risk that uh, you may take. And if uh, you make a profit, it's an individual profit. And if you have a loss, it's a collective loss. So putting in place different kind of regulation that avoid or that limit this uh, appetite for risk is also part of what has to be done. And uh, if we don't do anything of this, then of course we means that we didn't learn, learn anything from the crisis, and I can't imagine it will be a, the right attitude. The failure to agree on new international financial rules will allow big banks to play one country off another to see where they can find the most lax regulation. Many believe the competition between New York and London to be the financial capital of the world was a major contributing factor to the 2008 meltdown. Now the real problem that we face going ahead is that this same kind of pressure, where is going to be the financial capital of the world, is going uh, to come back once the crisis, memories of the crisis have faded. Um, certainly Frankfurt and Paris are going to be back into the race, but so are Tokyo, so is Singapore. And so is Shanghai, and so is Hong Kong. And what I think may well happen at some point is if Shanghai and Hong Kong combine, then you are really going to see a race to where's going to be the financial capital. And unless we have some kind of global oversight, it is going to be regulatory arbitrage. It is going to be a race to the bottom. Most of the G20 countries. Dominic Strauss-Kahn believes that a repeat of the 2008 global financial collapse is inevitable. I won't say it can happen again. It will happen again. When? I don't know. Two years, five years, ten years, twenty years. But there's no reason to believe that we have the silver bullet that make it possible to avoid any kind of crisis in, in, uh, in the global economy. The question is to try to first prevent, avoid as much as possible. And when we are unable to uh, avoid the crisis, to have uh, tools to mitigate the effect of the crisis. While politicians argued over regulations which might prevent the next global crisis, along came an explosion which made everyone think it was already here. spring of 2010, it looked as if the next global financial crisis was already starting. Yeah. 
the government of Greece had sunk dangerously into debt and would no longer be able to pay its creditors. Demonstrations filled the streets of Athens as millions lost pay and benefits. Many international investors believe that if Greece fell, other countries such as Portugal, Spain, Italy and Ireland would not be far behind. All those countries found it very hard to borrow money. Why should I lend any money to you unless I trust that you're going to pay me back? And if you show that you are not reliable, I'm not going to trust you, or I'm going to demand huge interest rates in terms of making my next loan to you. Sovereigns are no different from banks, no different from individuals. So we've got to restore trust. Trust was supposed to be restored in Greece and other weak European countries with a one trillion dollar bailout funded by the strongest European powers and the International Monetary Fund. So we should Dominic Strauss-Kahn worries that the bailout is only a temporary solution to Europe's problems. The problem of Europe is a bigger problem than the Greek crisis. The problem of Europe is a problem of low growth. The problem of Europe is the fact that there is almost no increase in productivity and that uh, this uh, huge uh, set of countries accounting for close to one third of the global GDP is just unable to, in the recovery, to take advantage of the recovery. So far, the recovery in most parts of the world has been funded by massive government spending. This was the way to quickly create jobs in everything from construction to engineering and thus alleviate the unemployment crisis. Now, a lot of people would say, you're just putting off the pain for a later date, and indeed we are. What we're doing is those governments are taking on debt to do that, and it's our children and grandchildren who presumably will eventually have to repay that debt in order to, uh, to finance our little rescue today, which might not work and might only put things, uh, put a day of reckoning off for another couple of years. For some leaders, such as Nicolas Sarkozy of France, the global financial crisis has been a profound shock that radically transformed their view of the world. Sarkozy has always been seen as a right-wing free enterpriser, very much pro-capitalist and pro-American. Then France was rocked by plant closures and labor upheavals. Some workers even kidnapped their bosses and turned to other forms of violence. Il nous faut trouver. In September 2008, Sarkozy gave a speech that astonished his audience. Le laisser faire, c'est fini. Le marché tout puissant qui a toujours raison, c'est fini. Je vous l'ai dit, je crois qu'on a tous changé au travers de cette crise. Et... En même temps que, que, que la bulle immobilière et que la bulle financière s'est dégonflée, euh, ça nous a tous permis de faire un peu un examen de, de conscience euh, de la création de valeur, euh, de la répartition des, des ressources, de l'allocation des richesses, euh, de la stratégie des pays les uns à l'égard des autres, de la mesure du bien-être. Je crois que sur tous ces points-là, nous avons tous évolué, le président de la République aussi. Ce sont des principes sains sur lesquels je ne céderai pas. President Sarkozy has asked some of the world's leading economists to come up with new ways of measuring growth and prosperity, to give greater consideration to the environment and quality of life. He wants a rethinking of capitalism. What gets measured gets done. Si vous n'êtes pas capable de mesurer quelque chose, Vous ne faites rien, vous n'améliorez rien puisque vous ne savez pas par rapport à quoi vous vous basez. Donc la, la mesure des choses est extrêmement importante. Je vous donne un, un exemple. Si vous pensez que l'eau n'a aucun prix, vous laissez couler tous vos robinets. 
ça n'a pas de prix. Et pourtant, ça a un coût. Vous consommez de l'eau. Donc il faut, pour chaque chose, pouvoir fournir une valeur, pouvoir fixer un prix. While many Western nations are rethinking capitalism, China is embracing it with a fervor that could prove dangerous. The Chinese economy has been surging ahead in the last few years. And many economists seem to believe that China can become a kind of engine that pulls the world out of recession. Chinese consumers are becoming richer, and there is hope that their increased spending will kickstart the global economy. On the other hand, there is widespread concern that the next real estate bubble that will lead to the next global meltdown is already inflating here. In the world's largest municipality, Chongqing, you see the construction of an endless supply of apartments right beside other apartment buildings that are largely unoccupied. Scenes eerily familiar from the real estate bubble which preceded the 2008 meltdown in Dubai and elsewhere. The Chinese Communist Party, however, tends to conceal any unpleasant facts about the economy here. Professor Michael Pettis teaches in the business school at Beijing University. He says China watchers have to resort to odd measures to try to get at the truth about the real estate bubble. A friend of mine in Shanghai came up with a very interesting indirect way of measuring inventory in, in Shanghai. You know, a couple of months ago, we had an eclipse of the sun at 10 o'clock in the morning in China time, and it was a total eclipse in, in Shanghai. So his reasoning was at 10 o'clock in the morning, you're supposed to be at work, so all the office lights should be on. And he just rode around the city checking out the office lights. And he said that he, you know, that's not a very scientific measure, but it led him to feel that there was an awful lot of empty office uh, space. Now there has been a more scientific study in which electricity consumption was closely measured in new office buildings and condominiums. The study confirms an enormous glut of unused office space and estimates that there are 65 million empty apartments in China, all evidence of a very dangerous real estate bubble. In the next few years, China and India are expected to take over some of the top spots among the world's leading economies, which only increases the worry about financial meltdowns starting there. If we're affected by a slowdown in the United States, if we're affected by a slowdown in Europe, what's going to happen when the two economies, two and a half billion people, China and India when there's a slowdown there? What's going to happen when a hedge fund fails in India? What's going to happen when there's a mortgage meltdown in China? The effect on the rest of us is going to be enormous. And the time to deal with those kinds of issues is now, before in fact it happens. Because if we don't ensure that Chinese banks are transparent, if we don't ensure that the Indian financial industry has a set of regulations that, that at least live to a minimal stand, world standard, then we are going to be in a mess that's going to make today look like a picnic. In the last two years, Canadians learned about the power and unpredictability of a financial crisis. Canada has had only a small taste of the wrenching protests and disruption that became the hallmark of the financial collapse around the world. This was the first truly global economic meltdown, where the interconnectedness of the world economy exploded in ways that very few bankers and economists had foreseen. And very few politicians knew how to deal with. History has taught world leaders that major economic crises like the Great Depression go on for years. Just when you think it's over, Along comes another relapse. 
Even though the causes of the 2008 meltdown are now clear, there is no magic formula to stop it from happening again. The world has to start planning for the next crisis, even as we recognize that this one is not over yet.